In this one, we're going to discuss the project that we're going to be building in this course. The core of the project is called a landing page. Now, what landing pages are really good for is marketing your ideas, getting your ideas out there and building interest for them. So in this case, I have just a simple landing page that I can customize. I can click and sign up, like put your name in here. In my case, it's Justin Mitchell. You can put an email. In this case, it's not a real one. I can go ahead and submit that and it will thank you for your entry. We could play a video and we could go down here and look at thumbnails. This is actually pretty nice. Now, the other part about this is since this is built in Django, I can go into the Django admin to users that I might want to use. Inside of the admin, I can manage all of that data that comes in. This is the one we just saw. Pretty neat. So in here, of course, I can add in notes and I can do all sorts of things, or I can look at how I'll start to build a full on web application with users by going into a, another part of the site, which is all of these entries, right? So these are all of the entries I've done so far. The most recent one being at the bottom, I come in here and now I can do my awesome notes, exclamation mark, hit send, save it, all of that stuff gives me a, uh, like a notification that the entry has been updated. I could jump back into the admin inside of Django, go into those entries, take a look at the email and see my notes and see which user actually did it and when it happened. Now, a lot of this seems like it might be incredibly simple. In some sense it is. And that's in part because of Django's rich ability to make a lot of these things simple. But another part about this is this is actually the foundation to building all kinds of software applications. And we're going to go into it step by step. Now, Django itself has built in features for users. You can add users, you can delete them. There's also groups where you can add permissions and stuff like that. That part's a little bit more advanced than what we'll cover here. But overall, Django itself has a lot of built in features that we're going to talk about. Now, one of the things I did not show you, which was on this sign up form, which is pretty cool. I actually have it where it's persistent. It knows that I signed up already. Uh, that's actually really nice. So if I were to end my session here, what I could do is I can also show you how awesome it is that Django has built in functionality for validating data. We talk about how to do it as well. But what I want to do now is say Justin Mitchell and I'll do abc at gmail.com now. Now, Gmail is a fine email service, but in this case, I'm going to go ahead and say I don't want to have Gmail. So I actually have validation that prevents you from using Gmail which I think is also pretty cool. So that sort of validation is things that we would want to consider whenever it comes to using input from proper users, like end users, other people. We want to validate things uh, on these forms and stuff like that. So we'll spend some time with that as well. Now, the point about all of this is to really give you a foundation in Django because this is your first Django project. You're going to go ahead and get all of this foundation down so you can really build something that you might want. And the other part about this, of course, is all of this code is available for you. We're going to go into things like Django models, Django forms, like I've already mentioned. We're going to go ahead and have automated tests so we can actually just write out tests to make sure that a lot of the features are working as intended. We're going to talk about URL routing, like how the actual pages get to render out the templates that we end up using. So yeah, we'll also be using templates that make writing HTML much, much easier. And of course, we're going to deal with managing user data and all those sorts of things as well, as well as like changing our database and setting a, a whole lot of stuff up uh, just to make sure that this is all working. This is also to implement a front end framework to make it look nice called Bootstrap. So we're going to talk about a lot of the fundamental things with Bootstrap that help us build applications. Now, a big part of the reason for that is so it looks good. As we see here, this looks a lot better than if I didn't have these styles. And especially when I start to break it down and go into mobile, it starts to look a lot more like what a real web application will end up looking like. And so much of that is thanks to the integration with Bootstrap. 
Now, if you do have any questions at this time, feel free to send me a message on Twitter. That's probably one of the easiest ways to get in touch with me. I try my best to answer all questions that I get as long as they're not spam or just trolling. The other thing is if you have questions about this course in particular, then go to this GitHub link right here. I'll talk about this a lot more in the next video, but you can write questions and comments in the discussions there. So let's go ahead and actually take a look at how to get help for this course right now. Hey, well, thanks so much for joining this course. I just wanted to give you a resource as to where you can get help when you run into issues. Now, trust me, we've all been there. We all run into issues, especially when we're doing something brand new. In some cases, some of you are learning how to code for the first time. In other cases, some of you are learning Django for the first time. Both things can get fairly complex, and sometimes it's just a simple question or reviewing my actual code that solves the problem. So to go to cfe.sh slash GitHub, this will take you to where all of the projects that I ever produce live, right? So every project that I write, all the code, everything's here. So if you go into repositories here, you'll be able to find this course's repository, which in this case, I just created it, so it's right on top. But if you need to find it, just look for your first Django project, and this one will come up. Click on that, and this is where you'll find all of the code you might need. I'll show you an example of a project that has code currently that will help a little bit as well. Now, when you do have questions or you have suggestions or you find a bug, or maybe you wanna actually challenge yourself and answer somebody else's question, you can go into this discussions area here. So this discussions tab is meant to answer questions, ask questions, submit bugs, all of that stuff right here on GitHub for our community for this particular course. As you probably just saw, I have a lot of different projects which often correspond to a lot of different courses. So if you just keep it to this single course, it's gonna be a lot easier for all of us. Meaning, don't jump into another course's discussion asking questions that are specific about this course. If it's Django stuff in general, that's probably okay for other Django courses. Uh, but the idea here is, you know, let's not, let's not get things too complicated in any given discussion. That being said, if it does start to get complicated based off of a simple question that is relevant to this course, I will love to review those things. I personally get a lot better by the questions that you ask. And yeah, I'm talking about you. You can ask all of the questions you want. The worst question that you could possibly ask is, well, not asking a question at all. So even if it's a really bad question, and you're embarrassed by it, you know, log into a new GitHub account and just ask it then. You don't have to have it on your personal account or anything like that. And of course, I'm not necessarily gonna verify that you own the course. This is a discussion that hopefully makes us all better, is the point. Now, if we wanna look at another project, a project example that at some point I do recommend that you try out, which is my Django REST framework tutorial, but looking at this project, you can actually see the various code items in here. And if you go to this, this uh, little drop down menu right here, this is for branches and tags. This course will have the same sort of thing where it's the start of lesson four and the end of lesson four, the start of lesson five and the end. So if you scroll down a bit, you will actually see the start of lesson 11, whatever that ends up being, literally the video 11, not necessarily text, but the video 11, you'll be able to come in here and see what the code looks like at that time. So in this case, I've got a really basic Python file that just does some really basic things. Maybe you don't know this yet, but at some point you'll know that this is incredibly basic, but that's exactly what it looks like at the beginning of this lesson. If I wanna see what it looks like at the end of it, I would just go to 11 end and then navigate back to that same thing. In this case, it didn't actually change, which is fine, but what if I actually go to another branch like way down here, 22 end, Perhaps that looks different, and it does, just slightly, but it's still different. So that's the important part of being able to review some of this code and get some of those questions answered. Now, this discussions thing is new. I haven't really done this very much on GitHub, and it's also a new feature to GitHub, so I'm really just testing it out, and guess what? This class is the first guinea pig for it because I actually have my classes hosted in a couple places, and that being said, 
it's gonna be a lot easier for all able to go to the same place for our code and our discussions related to the course. So if you do have any questions at all, please feel free to jump on there, ask those questions wherever you need to. Go ahead and do it. Give it a really good title so it's clickable and people want to actually look at it versus like, I need help, rather being like, hey, I don't understand how Python requests actually sends JSON data. That's a good example of maybe something that will be a good discussion to have and something we can provide a lot of different value for. Every once in a while, I'll probably put polls on here. As of now, I don't have any polls. So yeah, let's check out how this discussion ends up working. I hope it works out well. Thanks for watching a little bit about how to get help. Now, of course, if you still need help, well, Google is your friend. Searching things like how to pass JSON in Python requests, even with poor spelling, you'll find some answers. And Stack Overflow is often the place that I find answers, right? So here is that question. This is actually a much better question than the one I asked. So you'll also learn how to write better questions when you search them on Google as well. And being as specific and clear will also often answer the question for you. Trust me, it happens and it works. Cool. So if you have any questions at this time, based on what I just said, feel free, jump in and create a new discussion. Let's first go over the requirements you'll need to actually learn how to use Django. I'm assuming that you've probably never used Django before, or maybe it's been a while and you want a refresher. Either way, it's gonna be a first introductory look at how to use Django. Now, what this means then is we have some dependencies that Django has. Django, of course, is written in Python, so we need a specific version of Python. Now, if you go to pypy.org for Django, what you can do is you can actually scroll down on the side here and see that it's Python 3.8 and above is the requirement for Django 4.1. Now, this is gonna be 4.1 point whatever as well. So any version of Django 4.1 will require Python 3.8 and above. Now, for some reason, you can't get Python 3.8 and above. You're going to want to go into the release history here and scroll down to Django 3.2. And what you'll notice on this is it takes Python 3.6 and above. Now, the important thing about the difference between Django 4, Django 3, Django 2, and even parts of Django 1, well, what we're covering here is going to be fundamental to all of those versions. We are just going to be using 4.1 because it's the latest version, but you can absolutely get away with older versions of Django based off of the concepts we're talking about here because it's really the core of Django that hasn't changed a whole lot in a decade or more. So we can also verify this in a number of ways, one of them being inside of the DjangoProject.com. If we go into download here, we can actually see the versions of Django that are currently supported, like these older versions of Django. By all means, you can use 3.2 up until mid 2024 or so, but even after that, you will still be able to use it because it's still gonna be available and more than likely you'll still be able to learn from it. Now, there are a lot of courses that cover older versions of Django. I know this because I've authored many of them. There's also a lot of really great books that are older versions of Django as well, like Django 1.11. There might be a part of you that's like, I don't wanna learn anything about these old versions of Django, but the thing about this particular project, the Django web framework, the developers and the maintainers have tried their best to make it as backwards compatible as possible. So there's not huge breaking changes for older versions of Django. This is not true for all projects, of course. Django happens to be one that it is true for. Granted, I have a lot of old courses that cover old versions of Django, but I also know there's a lot of other great resources out there that do cover older versions of Django that once you have a foundation like what we'll do here, you'll be able to bounce around to the different versions and really have maybe questions every once in a while with errors that might come up. But overall, I think it will be fairly straightforward and painless to use older versions of Django as well as future versions of Django. So Django 4.2, that's probably gonna come out maybe by the time you're watching this, or even Django 5 and so on. 
those versions aren't going to be a huge departure. Now, of course, the documentation might say otherwise, and that's why you're always going to want to fall back on what the documentation says and hopefully what newer content of mine says. With that out of the way, let's go ahead and actually get this project started. At this point, I assume that this is not foreign to you. You know what this program is and you know how to toggle that terminal. And you can also type out Python and dash dash version, whether it's Python 3, whether it's Python 3.10, whether it's C slash Python 3310, Python.exe dash dash version, whatever you have to do on your machine, make sure that Python 3.10 is showing up or at least Python 3.8, which I also have on my machine, just for those of you who might be curious, you totally can use that one as well. Okay, so with that in mind, let's go ahead and start our project. First and foremost, I have VS Code open. Let's open up a folder where we're gonna store this project. Now me personally, I put it in my users root folder. Now, if you did your setup with me, you'll know that the users root folder is in CD, CD tilde slash. That is the users root, which looks like this. It's very similar on Windows and it's the same on Linux as far as how these two commands work. Where it's located might be a little bit different. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a folder in there. So there's two ways to do it, of course. I can actually navigate in here and go into the dev folder that I use, and then I can create my project here. Or what I could do is I can do make dir dash p tilde slash. This works on all platforms. We're gonna go ahead and do dev, and we'll go ahead and do first Django app, or let's call it project actually. We'll talk about apps in a little bit, but first Django proj. And that's where I'm gonna go ahead and put this. Now, if I do open period on a Mac, I will open up that folder. If you're on Windows, you'll do II. But this folder will open up. Well, in theory, it'll open up. I first actually have to navigate to it. So let's go ahead and navigate to it. And now let's go ahead and open up. Now doing that will allow me to actually just, you know, open this up, drag it into VS Code, and that will open up a new folder for me. Or of course, I can just go ahead and go to open folder navigate to where I actually created it, which is right here. Go ahead and open that up. Easy peasy. I really hope that you've already done this before. It's certainly possible that you haven't. And if you haven't, that's okay. We're doing it together step by step. If you have done this part, go ahead and create a virtual environment and then skip to the next one. Now we're gonna go ahead and save this workspace as, keep it in as first Django Praj. I'll go ahead and save that. Now I'm gonna go ahead and create my virtual environment. This of course helps me isolate my Python projects from one another. So I'm gonna go ahead and do Python, and again, dash dash version is giving me that one. So Python 3, dash M, VEMV, VENV, and press enter. Now, as a reminder, virtual environments help isolate your projects from one another. Now, this isolation happens because of Python. Python makes it do that. It's not perfect isolation, but it is really good especially for development, right? You'll probably not have a bunch of virtual environments on a production machine. You'll probably only have one, maybe two, but ideally speaking here on your development environment, having one is great. It's fantastic, exactly what you need. Now, depending on your version of VS Code, you might actually have something pop up here saying that, do you want this to activate by default? The virtual environment, go ahead and say yes. Definitely keep the name of it as VENV. And that's it. So we have our foundation as far as VS Code is concerned. Now what we need to do is actually create our Django project inside of this virtual environment. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and create our Django project. Now the first thing we need to do, of course, is activate our virtual environment. If you don't already have it activated, Mac and Linux users this is the command you're gonna call on the root of this project. Windows users, this is the command you're gonna call again on the root of this project. Now I'm gonna go ahead and activate it because I'm using a Mac and I'm gonna close out the Windows one. So when I say the root of this project, if I do PWD, the name of that folder we put this project in is right there, right? That's the root. And that's where we need to activate it because that's where v, the virtual environment actually is or VENV actually is. Cool. So with this in mind, we're gonna go ahead and install Django. Now we could just do pip install Django and this actually does work. Right? In my case, it's already installed because I did it. I did it off the video. But the idea here is this would actually install Django for you. 
but this is not the best way to install Django. What we're also gonna wanna do is pip install pip dash dash upgrade. This is also not the best way to install pip. The best way to install Django is to first off add a requirements file, so requirements.txt. Then we're gonna go ahead and declare Django in here. So this is getting the right direction. And then we can run pip install dash r requirements.txt and hit enter. And again, Django is installed and notice that it's installed in our virtual environment. That's also, of course, very important because my virtual environment is actually activated. Now there is another way to install it and that is using venv slash bin slash pip install pip or Django or whatever, right? So I can actually use the bin that's available inside of the virtual environment to install Django 2, that does it as well. But all of these are actually not the best way to do it. What we wanna do is use python-m. This is the most explicit way to use pip. So python-m pip, and then install dash r requirements.txt. Cool, hopefully you already know that, but there's a little refresher if you don't already. Now, we wanna actually have a specific version of Django. One of the ways to do that is just to use two equals and do 4.1. I actually want it to be greater than or equal to 4.1 while also being less than 4.2. Now 4.2 is the next major release and that's actually an LTS, which realistically I would probably rather use the LTS when I'm learning, but it's not out yet. So we're not gonna do that. We're gonna use these versions right here. Now, depending on if it is out and you wanna try it out, by all means, try it out. Let us know in those discussions if all your code works with 4.2. If you're adventurous, if you're courageous, go ahead and do it. If you want as little errors as possible with the code and the reference code, use 4.1. Okay, so with this in mind, we now have Django installed and we can verify this with python-m pip freeze and we'll see there's Django. Pretty sweet, Django is ready to be used. So let's go ahead and create our Django project. I'm gonna make a directory called SRC. I could do it in the terminal here, or of course I could do it up here. Either way, doesn't really matter. I'm gonna go ahead and navigate into SRC. This is where I'm gonna put my Django project code. So Django-admin start project CFE home period. I recommend that you stick with the same project name that I am creating just so we're all on the same page. If you change the project name, realize some of your imports, some of your challenges are gonna be due to that fact, due to the fact that you changed it to a different project name. Of course, after you learn, do it a different project name or better yet, have your other project right next to this one so you can switch back and forth. I do that all the time when I'm learning something new, especially when we're going step-by-step step like this. Anyways, so this period at the end here is gonna create the CFE home project this Django project inside of this SRC folder, it's not gonna go ahead and create a new one. So if I hit enter here, it's gonna create everything related to Django. Fantastic, super easy to do. And if I list everything out, I see only Django code, right? I don't even have the requirements in here. I have nothing related to my virtual environment. It's only Django code, which is why it's in this SRC folder. Now I'm gonna go ahead and run python manage.py run server, one of the fundamental Django commands that we will run a lot and then I'm gonna go ahead and do control click or command click on this link, depending on your system. And we'll open this up and what do you know? There is your first Django project running. Congratulations, be super excited. Because it's awesome. I mean, you are now on your first step to making a web application with Django. I think that's pretty cool. Um, so one of the things that actually happened here was this being made, db.sqlite3. So by default, Django creates a very, uh, minimal version of a SQL database for you. Django actually manages all sorts of things for you when it comes to a database. But when we did that run server command, that's actually what created this database, which I think is also really, really cool. Okay, so at this point going forward, you will see changes in the code on GitHub. Up until this point, you wouldn't have seen a single change. Going after this point, you will. I'll discuss that a little bit more when you see stuff related to GitHub, but congratulations on installing Django and getting your first Django project started. Super excited. Let's keep up this energy and go to the next one. All right, so a little housekeeping before we jump into this one, and that is we've got a few new files on here that I created off video 
readme, license, and git ignore. Now these files are specifically for version control or git and our GitHub account. So now if I go on to GitHub, I actually see code and all of those things in there as well. What I also have is in this drop-down menu, I have a few other branches here that I can look at. So like 6-end, as in the end of that last video, this is roughly what the code is gonna look like with of course the exception of those few extra files. So that's just the general idea that we're doing here from here on out. So you'll start to see new files being added and just keep in mind, SRC is gonna be where all of the Django stuff is. If for some reason I need to add other files outside of SRC, I will mention that when it happens. So with that out of the way, do keep in mind that when you go to one of these lessons, the entire code will be corresponding to that time. So the start of lesson seven versus the end of lesson seven when that happens. That also means that on VS Code, when I do make changes to some sort of file and save it, it's gonna change the color, right? So it's gonna basically be modified. If you don't have Git installed or working, yours is not gonna do that. Git is a little outside the context of what we're trying to do here, so I'm not gonna really be covering it other than the fact that it will track our changes over time, which is fantastic. Okay. So let's get back into Django and more specifically this page right here. Now, if I actually try to go to pages that don't exist, I will see errors like this. It will also give me this admin thing, right? So if I go to slash admin and hit enter, it gives me this Django administration. We will come back to that. Not yet though. For now, what I want to do is actually change this home page. I wanted to render something I want, right? Not necessarily this Django is working page, which it's cool that that's there. And it's cool that it gives us some references and some things that we can get help with. But overall, I wanna actually have something that is mine. So to do this, it's gonna take a two-step process. The first step is inside of CFE Home, we're gonna create a file called views.py, views.py. So views is a very, very common file name for the function or the code that will actually render out a specific URL or a dynamic URL, both things we will discuss. So what exactly does a view function look like? Well, first off we define it. Let's go ahead and call this just simply home page, and then it's going to return something. What we want it to return is actually an HTTP response. Now that is probably new to you. An HTTP response is really just what it, this is. So if I actually come back into Chrome and go to view, developer, and view source, you could do this on other browsers as well. It's viewing the actual HTML that comes in. So what happens when you go to a web page, the web browser goes and asks that server for a response of some kind, if it's available. Typically that response comes back as an HTML document. So we're gonna do something very similar to that right now with our view function. So the way we do this is jumping back into our view function, we wanna return something. And what I'm gonna return is an H1 tag just saying, hello world. This is what I wanna return. It's this string right here. Now in Django, I can't just return a string like this. I have to actually have it return a specific kind of response. Now in my case, for Django, what we're gonna do is run from django.http import the class of HTTP response, just like that. So this class is what we have to wrap around or initialize or instantiate, if you wanna call it that, the actual string that we're trying to return. Just an HTTP response, that's it. So this will actually return back that hello world, but now I've got a new issue. And that is, how do I actually even have this page show up? Like, how do I have a render here at all? That's something we need to do with URLs. Stay with us. All right, so a little VS Code housekeeping before we actually create our URL. And that's this little squiggly line under Django. Now, this is often because you have the wrong Python version selected inside of VS Code. So feel free to press that number there, and then we can actually select at the workspace level to our virtual environment, this one right here, right? Which is actually what it recommends. And once we do that, that often solves that problem. 
Now, if that doesn't solve your problem, you can go into extensions and search for PyLance and well, just disable it. I actually don't love PyLance myself. Hopefully at some point it's gonna be amazing. Right now, I just don't think it's that great. There's a lot of other packages that you might consider. For now, we're just gonna go ahead and leave it like this. So at this point too, what might be interesting is it will actually now start to activate my virtual environment for me because I actually changed the Python version that's coming in here. So kind of a cool convenience and PyLance often reminds you of that convenience because you need to fix it. Okay, so now what we want to do is actually have our URLs go to this web page. I wanted to actually respond with this data. So how do we do that? Well, first off in this homepage here, I want to go ahead and add in args and keyword args. As you may be aware, these are catch-alls for arguments that might be passed to this homepage, right? So I'm going to leave that for another time as the point because there are arguments that we want to check out. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and grab this homepage. I want to use this view. So inside of my URLs here, this is where I'm going to actually map all of the paths that my Django project might want to use. So in this case, we have admin right here. We already saw admin. I want to actually bring in my view. So one of the ways to do this is do from dot import views. Right, so what this is doing is inside of this folder here, it's looking for the module called views, otherwise known as views.py. And the reason we do that will become clear in a moment. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this admin one, paste it right below. I'm gonna get rid of everything in that string and just keep path empty. And then I'm gonna go ahead and do views dot, and I'll go ahead and select the home page. Now this is one of the coolest things about VS Code is when you do that, you can actually do all sorts of imports just like that. Okay, so we save that. And now what I've got is this home page routed to a path of some kind. So you might have the intuition to use a slash there. We'll talk about that in a second. You also might do something like ABC. You can actually put as many paths on here as you like. It's really up to you, right? So this is actually how you write those URLs so that when you come back to them and you wanna actually see them, the first one we're gonna try is that slash there, the index page, if you will, the root page of this web page, and I hit enter and it goes away. It tries all these different ones, but it doesn't actually show that index page, which is why I said just leave this as an empty string. That's just how it works. You don't need a slash there. You can omit it. Now the other ones, will need a slash, and we'll show you that in just a moment. So I'm gonna go ahead and save these. I actually save this stuff a lot, just so you know. I'm just constantly doing Command S or Control S, depending on what system I'm on, just to make sure all of my files are saved. So I wanna jump back into Chrome, and I wanna look at this homepage now, so I'll go ahead and refresh in here. What do you know? It says, hello world. So congratulations, you now have your very first own homepage on Django. Right, so if you know HTML at all, you'll know that you can start to really do some cool things just with this one single function. So if I go to ABC slash, it's the same thing, obviously. And if I go to ABC2 slash and hit enter, hey, what do you know, ABC2 does not allow for that trailing slash, uh, whereas the path itself never had it, right? So there are some nuances about how you design these URL patterns which we'll talk about a little bit more in this series. But overall, if you want that trailing slash there, you just need to include it, and that's how you do it. It's really, really that simple. Now, you might be wondering if I get rid of that trailing slash and hit enter, hey, what do you know, it automatically redirects to that. That's just one of those settings of Django. Now, all of these things right here aren't relevant, so I'll go ahead and comment them out to delete them very soon but you now have your first view and your first rendered HTML HTTP response. Now, this is just not very good HTML. We need to improve it. There's many different ways on how to do it. I'm gonna do it the way that's very Django and that is using Django templates in the next one. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and create our first Django template. Now, templates themselves are really powerful. We are actually gonna be just using some plain old HTML, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. But right now, I need to create a folder that's gonna hold these templates. Now, typically speaking, you'll put that folder inside of SRC, right next to where manage.py is, and we'll go ahead and create a new folder, and we'll just call it templates, just like that. 
In this case, I'm gonna go ahead and do index.html. Now, if you're familiar with HTML itself, index.html is typically reserved for the root path, right? So this path right here will often render index.html. We'll do that same thing right now, but we're gonna render it through Django, not through an HTML page. That's the point. So what I wanna do is actually have some HTML in here. I'm actually still not gonna put valid HTML in. Instead, what I'm gonna do is put this HTML. It's valid in the sense that it's an H1 tag, that part's valid, but all of the other HTML things like doc type, head, body, all of that stuff is not in here. If you don't know what those things are, I'll talk about it in a little bit. But now what I wanna do is actually wanna render out this index.html page. So the key thing here is render. So I want to render out an index page, this HTML page or some text itself. So I'm gonna go ahead and comment out this HTTP response. And instead what I'll do is from Django.shortcuts, we're gonna go ahead and import render. Okay, so we're gonna now use render in here. And there's a few arguments that render requires. One of those arguments is called request. The next one is called the template string, as in where it's located. In my case, it's just index.html. Now this request argument here, we actually haven't talked about, but every single view has this request argument come in, assuming that there is a URL wrapped to it. I'm gonna go into this a little bit later, but for now, just know that every view has the request. That's by default with Django, and how it's passed in is a parameter just like this. Now this right here is a path to where index.html is, in a templates directory. So in this case, the templates directory is just one thing and it's index.html. In other words, this string right here should be relative to templates. So if I said for something like this, I said home page and I wanted to do abc.html and I'll go ahead and copy this hello world and say hello abc. And this would then turn into homepage slash abc.html. That's really it. That's the main main part of this. But I'm not gonna go ahead and use that yet. We definitely will see it later, just not yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this to index.html. Okay, so my homepage is a lot closer to what I want it to be. I've got a render, I've got an HTML file. Let's go ahead and save it. And let's refresh on our homepage. I get template does not exist. What? What is going on here? This is an error that, why does this exist? <laughs> well, obviously I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna tell you why, but this is an error you'll probably see from time to time. And it actually is for a number of reasons as to why it might not exist. But Django is gonna look for these HTML documents throughout your project, depending on how you have it wired or how you have it configured. Now, in this case, what it's looking for is index.html, in this folder right here, so this templates folder. Look at that path there, that path should look awfully familiar on your machine. In my case, it's you know my dev folder, then my Django project, it's in my virtual environment bin, or excuse me, lib, Python 3.10, the site packages, Django, and so on, right? That is actually a real existing place with real code, but not code that really matters to what I'm trying to do. So this leaves us with the configuration being left. What we need to do then is jump into settings. This is where we do all of our Django configuration. So I'm actually gonna do this configuration part for you because it's pretty straightforward. So we're gonna scroll down to where templates are and we're gonna go ahead and add in base underscore dir slash the quote of templates. So what is this doing? Base directory is where manage.py is and templates is what do you know, that folder that's right next to manage.py, this folder right here. So this of course is pathlib. If you're not familiar with pathlib, well, I highly recommend learning it. And if you've seen older versions of Django, what you would see is something like this, where it's base dir and then templates. These, both of these values actually do work. But pathlib makes it so much easier because this actually ends up being something pretty cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and do templates dir as a variable in here. And I'm just gonna go ahead and print this out so you can see how cool pathlib is. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that. 
and we're gonna rerun the server. I'll do control C to cancel it out and rerun it. And if I scroll up a bit, I actually see the path to that templates directory, right? This is path lib. So if I did another one like ABC and then slash one, two, three, and then, you know, whatever else you want in here and save that, what you'll end up seeing is whatever that path is, right? And it's also true on Windows. So the exact same path, if you will, will be relative to what machine that you're on, which is also why Pathlib is really, really cool. Versus just copying and pasting the absolute path, right? So um, one thing that is valid on your local machine would be to use the absolute path to that templates directory, which might be something that you're like, oh, I should do that. I don't recommend it. You should actually leverage Pathlib and learn more about it if you're so interested. Uh, but it's really simple. It's really straightforward. And I think it's really intuitive. Again, if you have questions on that, let me know in the GitHub discussions for this course. But now, now we have templates configured. So now Django knows where to look for this template. I'm gonna name it incorrectly again. I'll just call it ABC for the sake of learning. We'll go back in here and refresh and notice that it says template does not exist again, but this time it actually gave us a brand new place to look. It actually looks now in that templates directory for that ABC file, which of course is not what we actually wanted to use. Instead, we wanna use index.html. So I'm gonna go ahead and refresh it. And what do you know? Now it's based off of HTML. Okay, so this alone, if you're like, wow, I can now build an entire HTML site based off of this one feature. How cool is that? I think it's pretty cool. But of course, we still need a little bit of improvement with our templates because it's not just about rendering out an HTML file. It actually does a lot more than just that. And that's something we'll do in the next one. Stay with us. Now we're gonna go ahead and introduce the concept of template inheritance and why you actually will want to use Django's templates, the built-in templates. So inside of the templates directory, we're gonna create a new file called base.html and I'm gonna change index to something different. I'm just gonna go ahead and rename it to simply home.html and then in my view, I'll go ahead and render out home.html, okay? So what we wanna do here is I want to inherit a bunch of properties from base.html into home.html. So those properties would be something like doc type HTML, then the head tag, and let's go ahead and just put in a title tag here and say your first Django project, right? Then we can also add in our body tag and close that off as well. And I'm missing a big one, which is the HTML tag. And there we go. Okay, so I wanna inherit parts of this. Realistically, what I wanna do is be able to replace what's inside of this body tag with this content. So let's take a look at how that's done. First off, we declare a, a block here. So we use these curly brackets with a percent sign and say block content. And then we need to close off that block in block just like that. Now it's very similar to HTML, but this of course is Django templates. It's not HTML at all. Now the reason it has these curly brackets in the percent sign is because those are not typically found in anything related to HTML. They're not typically found in JavaScript, which is often in HTML. It's not typically found in CSS or cascading style sheets, which again is also HTML. And it's certainly not an HTML element like body, like H1 and so on. But what I can do here is I can actually copy this block content or these blocks here and I can bring them into my HTML document and I can paste it in and then tab this back and there we go. So I now have these blocks here. But of course, Django doesn't know where these blocks should be rendered, where it should actually replace it. So what I'm gonna do then is I'm also gonna go ahead and add in extends base.html. In other words, this home.html is going to copy everything that's in base.html, but replace the blocks as I see fit. So another block I could replace in here is maybe the title tag. So I'm gonna go ahead and do block title and then in block just like that, okay? So we'll replace that one in just a moment. But the idea again is you have the parent 
template, which in this case is based on HTML. And then the child template, the template that's going to actually grab a bunch of things from the parent uses extends whatever that template name is. And this string right here, whatever it's trying to grab is going to extend in a very similar way as to what we did with render, meaning that leaving home is going to go ahead and come back in here and look for base.html inside of this templates directory. Um, and so that's a key part of this. And of course, if I had it in a subfolder, like let's call that base and let's call it index or, uh, or maybe like roots.html or something like that, then you would come back into home and you would just say base slash root.html and that's how you would inherit that. It's certainly something else you will do from time to time when you get more advanced with Django. But for now, we're gonna leave it as simple as we can and we'll just leave it in here as inheriting from base. Now, if your mind's not fully wrapping around what's going on here yet, stay with me because we definitely will go over it a couple of times. So I'm gonna go ahead and save everything and I'm gonna refresh inside of Chrome. And now my hello world changed a little bit. I see there's a title tag here now. And if I go to view that page source and refresh, I now have valid HTML. It's a lot closer to valid HTML. So what I wanna do though is on this hello world page, my, my index page, I wanna have a welcome item. I want it to basically say, you know, welcome and then dash. That's what I want the title to be. So how do I actually go about doing this? Well, first off, we're gonna grab that block from our parent template, the one that it's extending from. I'm gonna go ahead and paste this block in here and whatever I open in terms of HTML, I must close, including these Django template blocks. So open, close, and now I can go ahead and say welcome. Save that, I'm saving everything as I go, always. And I'll go ahead and refresh in this page. And what do you know, it still says welcome. But what it doesn't say is everything else. It doesn't say your first Django project. So one of the other cool things about template inheritance is, yes, I can replace the values that are inside of this block, but I can also include the original value as well. The way to include that original value is using two curly brackets and block dot super. We can save that. This will now get the original value of whatever that block is and append it to this so I can refresh in here and now it's actually giving me this welcome your first Django project. This is, I think, pretty neat. So if I actually copy this whole template all over again, we're just gonna go ahead and put abc.html, paste in here, and then we'll go ahead and say, hey, hello, abc, and then abc, just like that. Go back into my view here. I'm gonna go ahead and copy this home page, paste underneath it, and we'll just call this my abc page we wanted to render out abc.html. Of course, if I create a view, that also means that I need a URL to route to it. Then I'm gonna go ahead and add in that URL path with abc slash. Views is no longer gonna be views.homepage, but rather views.abc page. Save it. And if you're not aware, this is actually why we just did dot views as an import. So I can just grab those other views that are inside of that views module. Anyways, so now we've got the home page, and then if I go to slash ABC with an in slash, I now see hello ABC with this change right here. Pretty neat stuff as far as these templates are concerned. Now, there's a lot more we could talk about with templates, but as far as how it's set up right now, we are actually in a really, really good position to use a well, a CSS framework or a CSS library called Git Bootstrap which is something we'll do very, very soon. But before I do that, I actually want to improve how these templates work because we are programming right now. These things are repetitive just with some variables changing. So let's actually see what that looks like in the next one. All right, so you're probably at least a little familiar with Python and string formatting. Now you might be familiar with F strings. So let's say for instance, on my home page here, I'm gonna go ahead and say title equals to uh, welcome home, right? And to do an F string, maybe we have a paragraph uh, that we wanna call, you know, we put in the title there and I'm gonna go ahead and add my name in, right? Something like that, right? So this is of course F string substitution. There is another version of this, which is formatting and we just use title equals to title, right? So that is certainly still doing that string substitution.
Now we could also go even further and say context is equal to a dictionary. That dictionary, we can add in the title as a key, and then you could either add the variable value or the string itself, doesn't really matter. Then I can do title just like that. And what I could do then is in this format, I can then unpack that dictionary and the title key will then match with the format value that will change. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? Well, that's because of how Django renders out context. I can actually get rid of this parag or paragraph string here. And inside of this render method, I can actually pass in that context, right? So now I have this context that has welcome home as a title key. So this title key is something I can render in home.html. And what I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna bring in Parag again and comment it out for a moment and leave in that context dictionary coming through. Now, the reason I'm leaving that is because of how this actually renders just in pure Python. We see that there's just a curly bracket title in curly bracket. So if I copy that and bring it into home.html, I can paste it in here. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste that in just like that, right? So this is almost there, but Django is slightly different. So instead of one curly bracket, we actually use two curly brackets inside of a Django template. Now, this is actually not much different than the Jenja templating engine as well, if you've ever heard of that. Um, if you haven't, that's okay too. But anyways, this is actually how you will now render out this particular variable. These are called context variables inside of a Django template, but it's incredibly powerful because we can now go hello world instead of that, we can just put the title. And then up here, instead of welcome, we can also put the title. And now I can get rid of, uh, you know, I could add arbitrary text in there as well. But now this is completely made by programming. That programming comes from this view here, specifically with the context and the items that are coming through with that context. So the other cool thing about this then is I can actually use this home page, well, basically all over again and call this the ABC page and just say ABC instead of, you know, welcome home. And this is now using a different template altogether. I no longer need this ABC template. Now, of course, this is an option. This is not something I'm gonna keep long-term, but it is something that's really, really cool and makes things really easy on us. So if we actually refresh inside of here, we now see ABC, it's rendering out and it's doing that string substitution with those context variables that we've got right here. Now, these context variables can be a lot more powerful than this. They don't have to just be a string. They can be a list, they can be a form, they can be all sorts of things. And we'll definitely talk about those things going forward. Uh, but this is now getting a lot closer to what you might actually use in production uh, as far as you know views and all that is concerned. So that's pretty cool. But now we're at a point where I wanna actually implement a proper CSS library. That library is called Bootstrap, just to make things look a little bit better and be mobile responsive out of the gates. At this point, we're gonna go ahead and implement Bootstrap. That is at getbootstrap.com and we're gonna be using version 5.2. Now, the reason we're doing it now is because we finally understand about Django template inheritance. So it'd be nice to actually make our site look a little bit better, just right out of the gates, roughly speaking. And we'll add some components here and there. And we'll also learn a little bit more about Bootstrap as we go forward. But of course, Bootstrap itself can be its own course. So if you're really interested in that, let me know in, of course, the discussions on the repo. But for now, we'll go ahead and just do some of the basics with Bootstrap. So go to getbootstrap.com, click on Docs. You're gonna to wanna to scroll down a bit and you're gonna to wanna to look for the including of Bootstrap CSS and JavaScript. That's all of this right here. And this is a hosted version of the CSS and JavaScript. So go ahead and copy that to my clipboard and we're gonna bring it over into our templates into base.html. And I'm actually gonna paste it above my previous one for several reasons. One of them being that I can actually now just cut and paste the title tag here, right there. And then in the body, I want to put my content right here. So go ahead and grab this block content and replace it with that H1 tag, save that, and we'll go ahead and get rid of my old HTML. And then we'll save everything and we'll jump back into our homepage 
and it doesn't really look a whole lot different. Granted, the text has changed a little bit, but let's go ahead and actually make it look different with something. So what I wanna do then is scroll down a bit and I actually wanna find a, a nav bar. So inside of components, if I scroll down to nav bar, I can scroll down a bit more. Here's a nav bar that I'm gonna go ahead and copy. Let's grab that nav bar and we'll come back into VS Code. Inside of my templates here, I'm gonna go ahead and add in a new file called a navbar.html. And I'm just gonna go ahead and paste this in. At this point, I'm not gonna change a thing. I'm just gonna leave it like this. Maybe you can actually write your brand name here if you want. In this case, I'll go ahead and do CFE Home. That's something you might wanna do, but we don't need to change anything yet. There's a part of me that assumes that you actually have no idea what's going on in here. So we might have to talk about that a little bit too. Uh, but then there's also some of you that probably know HTML really well, so you know how to modify this too. So depending on where you're at, don't necessarily modify it yet. The key of this is twofold. One, of course, was to bring in Bootstrap. The other one was to show you one other really cool template feature, which is the include tag. So we can write this thing called include. Of course, it works very similar to the block tag, but it doesn't need to be closed because what you're including here is a document. So in my case, I'm gonna go ahead and include navbar.html and save it. And then I'll go ahead and go back into my project, refresh in here. And what do you know? I already have a much better looking site. Now there's still a lot to go, but it already looks a lot better. And then I've got these drop downs here that I can work with, which is fantastic. Now going back into my templates, I actually wanna change this slightly. And inside of templates, I'm gonna go ahead and add in something called base as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and drag the nav bar in there. So inside of base.html, I'll go ahead and do base slash nav bar, just as a piece of, well, the basic things that I might want. Now this is also true for my CSS. This link right here, I'm gonna go ahead and cut that out. Inside of base, I'll go ahead and do css.html. I'm gonna paste this in here and then back into base.html. Yet again, I'll go ahead and do include and it's gonna be simply base slash css.html, just like that. And then what do you know? There's JavaScript in here as well. What do you think I'm gonna do? Open up base js.html and then again, paste that in there and then back into base. We'll go ahead and do include and base slash js.html, save all that and save everything, and there we go. And then I come back in here and I refresh and it's exactly the same. Everything's working and it is mobily responsive as we see here. Now I will continue to improve upon this and how it actually ends up looking. And a lot of this will be coming directly from Bootstrap's documentation, like just copying things like I just did. That is actually certainly one way you can learn how Bootstrap works in addition to what I tell you uh, while we do it. Now the key thing about this was of course, make it look better, make it function a little bit better, but also to introduce that include tag and how clean base.html ends up looking right here. And the reason I do it this method is because, oh, now I know all of my CSS links need to go in just a css.html so I can make that really, really minimal. Same with JavaScript and same with the nav bar. I can, I can do a number of things related to the navigation bar, just right in nav, navbar.html. And then the coolest thing about template inheritance is now anytime I run this extends base.html, all of that stuff is included no matter what page I'm on. So it really just kind of breaks apart what could be a really, really long page, but then puts it all together when we actually need it to be rendered, which if you wanna know the magic function called render, that's what this is doing. It's gonna go ahead and take in the request, which we'll still talk about, but really it's just taking in these two these two values here and going through all of the template inheritance, all of the include statements, all of the context variables, and mixing these things together to give us some sort of result. Not actually a whole lot different than what we saw here, but of course, instead of format, it's a render and it's giving us more features than this simple Python string substitution one, but it does give us a lot of things right out of the box, which I think is great. And so now, of course, from here going forward, we can make our site 
look really, really cool and have the value that you'd want when it comes to, you know, building a, your first Django application. So at this point, we kind of have a fancy website renderer, right? Like it just renders out HTML documents in a way that's pretty convenient, but it's not quite a web application yet. Sure, it's called Django, but it's not actually storing anything yet. We haven't built the features necessary to store data. So what we wanna do now is actually start that process, start actually storing some data in a database. In this case, we'll be using SQLite 3, but changing it to Postgres or MySQL is pretty easy to do. So what we wanna do now is we wanna actually start creating forms. That's ways to actually collect data from a user, from somebody visiting our website. So we're gonna go ahead and create a new file called forms.py. And this is where we will actually write out our very first form. So to do this, we're gonna go and do from Django import forms. And then we're gonna generate our first form, which is gonna, we'll just call this our landing page form. And it's gonna be forms.form. Okay, so in here, we've got a couple of things that are important. We've got fields that we might wanna use, as in the actual data that we might wanna get. Let's just do name and email for right now. Or if you wanna be really simple, you can just do email. So we want a name and we want an email. How do we actually get those fields? Well, one of the ways that you could do it is by using Django form fields. So doing a quick search for Django form fields, you'll see a lot of documentation on this, on how Django form fields end up working, including an email field like what we see here. So what we can do is we will just start with an email field because the documentation has that, it's very clear. It's simply forms.email field. Now VS Code helps us cheat a little bit and actually gives us a lot of these field names right off the bat, but this is now a form that we'll be able to use. So let's actually see how I can render this form. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this class. Forms are always a class, they're not a function. And I'm gonna go ahead and copy this class. And then inside of my views here, I will import it. So from dot forms, we're gonna import that landing page form. So to render this form, the first thing that I need to do is say form equals to an instance of that form. And then I'll go ahead and bring it in to my context that I want to render on my homepage. Remember how I said, that this context could be all sorts of things. It doesn't have to be a string. It could be forms, it could be lists, it could be something called query sets. It's a lot of stuff you can add into template context. So this form itself right here is now a context variable that I can use on home.html. So inside of my templates, let's go ahead and open up home.html and I'm just gonna use curly brackets form, save it, and then we'll go ahead and have a look at that form. I hit enter on that home page, and there it is, right? So at this point it has CFE in here and that's likely because of auto, um, automatically filling it. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up just a private browser window right now. And we'll go ahead and do abc at abc.com. And there's my email, I'm gonna go ahead and enter. Nothing happens. Okay, so if you come from the HTML world, you might have a sense as to why. If you don't, well, the reason is because we didn't actually put it into an HTML form element. That's it. So once we have it into a form element, I can still use this email and I can paste it in here and hit enter. This time what happens is we actually get the HTML in the actual URL, which is actually pretty interesting. It's kind of curious as to why it does that. So before I go any further, you might be like, well, wait, wait a minute, hold on. My nav bar does have a form in it. Perhaps you saw this, maybe not. This form itself is actually just like what we saw, except the actual inputs are rendered manually. I'll explain that in a second. But in the search bar, if I said hello world and hit enter, it gives me just a question mark on here. Now this is because this input was never given a name. So if you give it a name of let's say query and save it, and then you know refresh on our page here and then run hello world and hit enter, now the URL grabs this query and updates that. 
very similar to the abc at gmail.com or whatever. It is also doing a, well, roughly a query. It's not called query. It's called email in this case, but it is a query. This has to do with the method that is being used on the form. Okay. So when it comes to HTTP, we have all kinds of interesting methods here. So let me just close this down a little bit. What we are seeing right here are all of the get requests. So typically when you go to a web page and you're looking for something, you are trying to get it. There's another kind of request called post. So this actually might help ring a bell back to what we talked about with the views. There's an argument in here called request. So we can actually print out that request method. So if I save this now and refresh on any given page, I can hit enter, enter, enter. Two things are happening. It's printing out the get method. It's also showing me in the log, the Django log, the get method. But overall, it's printing out get, right? So I can also do if the method is get, what does that look like? We can refresh in there and it'll give me a true statement. Hey, what do you know? That's pretty cool. Now there's a whole nother method called post. So the post method is actually how you send data. Now this actually might remind you of the mail, right? So when you're actually sending mail through the post, that's what you do. You post it, you send that mail. So that's actually how we collect data. We collect data with the post method. Now the only way we can use that post method is by our form itself, the actual form element, we can declare a different method. So the default is git. We don't even have to write git, that's just the default. If we don't put anything in there, it's gonna default to git. Post is the other method. This is the method that helps us send data to the backend. This is pretty much the only method we wanna use when collecting data from our users, whether it's logging in users or collecting data like what we're doing right now. So now I've got this post method here. I'm also gonna go ahead and put in a button with a type of submit and then just say send, okay? So this was being done when I pressed enter inside of that one input, but it's probably a good idea to have a button uh, that allows you to submit this form as well, just like what we see in our nav bar, right? We already, we've already seen that. So going back into this homepage now, we have a new method, we have a form with an input, and we have a button to send said form. So I'm gonna go ahead and go back into my web page here. There we go. And here's my email. Notice it doesn't have any styles really, and it certainly does not have a placeholder like this one up here. But there is a button, and I can now go ahead and give it a shot with an email, and I can go ahead and hit send, and then I get this forbidden. Interesting, what is this all about? So this is actually a security feature for Django. Now something you might not be that surprised about is as soon as you allow data to come to your server, to the backend, to Django, as soon as you start doing that, you will introduce hackers, people attempting to maliciously use your site. It's not always hackers, of course, but maybe it's someone using your site incorrectly. And so Django and a lot of web applications have something called a CSRF cookie. This is cross-site request forgery. So in other words, my website can't automatically submit a form on your website um, in a automated fashion. I mean, there are ways around that specifically, but just in, for all intents and purposes here, we are gonna be using this as a way to secure our site a little bit better. So now I can go ahead and put in this CRF token in here on this form. Going back into my web page here, we'll go ahead and run this form again. And I'll go ahead and hit send. This time, nothing appears to happen, as in no errors, nothing comes up in here, and then the form is now empty. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually go back into our view where it's collecting this data. So if we take a look at the form, we've got the form rendering, we have our request coming through, and what I can also do is print out request.post. So I can also print out request.get, both things. But something else that I should note, 
not just that it can I print those things out, but I can also scroll up and see that the post method was being triggered by that form. Great, it wasn't causing an error before like it was the, with the CRF token. As we see here, that's a 403 error. Okay, so now let's go ahead and take a look at this again. And this time I'll go ahead and do abc at gmail.com. I'll hit enter to send it, or you can press the button of course, go back into VS Code, toggle open up that terminal, scroll down a bit. And what we see here is two items. One has a CFRF middleware token. And what do you know, an email, the other one does not. So the first one is that post data. The second one is the get data, which we'll talk about some more later. Uh, but for now, what I wanna do is I wanna print out that data. So I'm gonna go ahead and do print request.post.get and email, save that, and we'll run this again. So back into our homepage here, abc at gmail.com, and doesn't really matter that I spelled it incorrectly, but what do you know, there's the print statement. So I'm now starting to actually be able to collect some of this data. But what I'm doing is I'm actually removing some of the great features that Django's has, which we'll come back to for sure. The last thing I wanna look at right now, before we actually start to save this data, is how this form is being rendered on the page itself. We already saw the data that was coming through, so if I go back into this, you know, page and go to view, developer, source. And if I scroll down to where that, where that form is, we see the form right here. We see that there is an input in here that's hidden that is the CFRF middleware token. So the value that I was rendering, this right here actually renders that input. It just renders that hidden input inside of the form so that when we submit the form, it won't cause an error. Now, of course, there are other errors that could happen with a form, but right now, that's it. It's pretty neat how this is done. Now, what I still wanna do is actually validate this data. I wanna make sure this is valid data prior to even attempting to save it anywhere. And there's a couple of different ways on how we could do that. So what we'll do in the next one is we will add a, another field and validate this data to make sure it is correct, valid data that's coming through and we'll take a look at the forms a little. All right, so going back into our homepage view, we have two options or two methods that this could possibly be. It could be a get method or it could be a post method. There are other kinds of methods that it could be, but let's just leave it to these two. So what that means is sometimes I'll be getting post data, sometimes I will not be. In other words, if I comment out this print statement here and just say in this print statement say, your email is, save all of that and come back into our view and just run it a few times, just hit enter or refresh, whatever, and then go back into our VS Code into the terminal, we get all of this none statement, your email is none and so on and so forth. So what I can do is I can actually use my form in a more effective manner and that is I can actually pass in this request post data or none, right? So now what we can do is we can actually clean up what this data is. This is that form validation that I mentioned. So we can now say if form.is valid, then we can print out form.cleaneddata.get and email. Okay, this clean data is something we will discuss quite a bit in this one. So. What's happening here is the actual form is now taking in the requested data, which if you remember, it's just a dictionary that also includes a CFRF token, but it's taking in a dictionary or it's not. If there's not a dictionary, it's not gonna run anything. Form is valid is actually a method itself. So this method will check to make sure that that form is valid and then it'll go ahead and print out that data if it is. So what this means then is when I do a get request, it's never gonna ask for that data. If I didn't have or none in here, let's take a look at what happens. Just request post. I come back in here, again, do another get request. I'm now getting this field is required. This is a validation error, which is pretty cool. It's a validation error based off of the fact that, well, it's looking for post data, but again, that post data is nothing. So if I did request.post, and took a look at that data, refresh in here, still validation error, 
but it's it's just an empty query dictionary. It's an empty dictionary that's coming through. It's the same thing as just putting in an empty dictionary in here and refreshing and notice it's still having that error, which is pretty nice. It's nice that, that we actually have this feature from the get-go. So I'll go ahead and use the standard operating, which is request.post or none. And then we'll go ahead and see if this data is valid and we'll see if it's an email, okay? So coming back in here, I'm gonna go ahead and do abc at gmail.com again, hit enter. And well, nothing seems to change. It actually is printing out this data, but the form didn't clear out. That's actually pretty nice. So I'll explain that in a moment, but first what I wanna do is get, like actually cause another validation error. So inside of my forms, what I can do is say, define clean underscore, whatever field name that I've got in there, and that's gonna be email, and this takes in self. The data I wanna get is the email, and that comes from self.cleaneddata.get email. Hey, that looks familiar. And then I'm gonna go ahead and say, if email.ends with gmail.com, then we'll go ahead and say self.add error, and it's gonna be email, and it's gonna be, you cannot use Gmail. And then we'll go ahead and return the email itself, okay? That's one way to add an error. We'll do another way as well. And we'll, the other way, the traditional way, is raise forms.validation error. And again, you cannot use Gmail. I'll show you both ways. First off, we'll do this one, validation error. You cannot use Gmail. All right, let's come back in here and we'll go ahead and say abc at abc, or rather at gmail.com. Let's go ahead and copy that, hit enter. What do you know? It says you cannot use Gmail. Pretty sweet. If I get rid of that raise and put in the add error, notice that I'm using the field name in this add error and refresh and submit it again. It says you cannot use Gmail. Seriously. Pretty neat. Okay, so that's actually really nice that we can now add our own validation errors. But we can go a little bit further than that. And that is, let's go ahead and put in another email here. And we'll just call this email two. And I'll just give it a new label. And we'll call this confirm email. Now, this is a lot closer to what you might end up happening with any sort of landing page. Maybe you put the email in twice, or maybe you do this for passwords or something along those lines. In this case, what we end up doing is we get rid of this email here. I'll leave this one in for a moment and we'll paste this in. I'll actually keep that Gmail error for now. And we'll also use a, another clean command. This time we'll go ahead and do data equals to self.cleaned data. And I'll go ahead and, and return that data. Then from here, we'll go ahead and grab the first email and then I'll grab the second email. So email two from that data. Again, these are all just the field names themselves. And then we'll go ahead and say, if email two is not equal to email, then we'll go ahead and add the error again and say, your email must match. Save that. And we can refresh in here, abc at gmail. Let's go ahead and do that and paste it in, hit send. You cannot use Gmail seriously. Okay, let's do Gmail. Hit send. This time they match. Let's make them not match. What do you know? You cannot use Gmail seriously and your emails must match. Pretty sweet. Two different validation errors. Now this one, this particular validation error actually goes on the email field itself inside of this clean method. If I get rid of that and do it like this, it does not go into the email field. It does what's called a non-field error. That's just a, a little advanced stuff that you know separates these things out, right? In some cases, you might wanna separate them out. In other cases, you wanna actually be explicit about the error and where it occurs. Pretty neat. Okay, so what about the name? What about that field? Well, I can go ahead and do name and that equals to forms.char field or character field. And I can do required equals to false. So I can save that. And now if I refresh in here, what do you know? I've got a name in there. And I'll go ahead and say justinabc at gmail.com. 
abc at gmailer.com and hit send granted it now would actually send that data back to me and we see some of it coming through but not all of it so that, and of course that's because i actually only got some of it save that again refresh in here again submit the form again and now we can actually take a look and there is all of that data. So we're certainly ready to start saving that data. We're also ready to start refreshing the form itself, which is incredibly easy. We're just gonna go ahead and do form equals to another instance of the landing page form, assuming the data is valid. Now, the reason this occurs is because the context object here is how it's changed, right? So if we have that request post data already in there, it's gonna stay in there. This will actually reinitialize the form and it will just leave it empty. It's much like saying uh, none in here. So basically start a brand new form for us. And that's how simple that part is. Now, I realized that we probably went a little fast on this form validation stuff, um, but it's, it's actually something that I think is worth a watch and also uh, something that you might want to play around with a little bit more. Now, this form validation stuff, is, this is not the last time we'll do this. In fact, we will do a little bit more stuff with forms as well that are um, even more robust than this, or maybe a little bit easier, less friction than this. Um, but the actual field names themselves, all of the different kinds of forms that are available, I always just do Django form fields. I do a quick search for that, go to the documentation, and I wanna look for all the different form fields that are in there because there's a ton. There really is a lot of different kinds of fields that Django has supported that you could absolutely add in. And what we see here too, of course, is the documentation related to these items, um, which I think is also fairly straightforward and you can learn a lot from the documentation. Uh, but the nice thing is here is that's how we can create a form. And it's, I think, pretty straightforward. Now you absolutely can hard code a form but we don't need to do that if we don't need to do that, right? Django actually does the work for generating all of the things related to the form that we might need. Now, of course, one other thing that I wanna do with this form is add in some different styling things. So it actually has bootstrap related things to it as well. That's something we'll do soon too. Now we want to improve the look and feel of our form fields. At this point, the form itself does take in the data. We don't save it yet but it does take in the data. So it actually, technically speaking, works. Now, this doesn't look nearly as nice as this does. And it's just a subtle change, but it's a big enough one that it makes your site just look and feel that much better to users. And of course, this means we're gonna be leveraging Bootstrap and more specifically, the form control example here. It's gonna be a lot like this. I'll come back to that in a moment. And we're also gonna learn about how to modify our form fields a little bit more than what we've currently done, right? And so this takes in some core elements of these form fields. So if we go back into our form here, what we wanna do is we wanna just change the styling that's related to this. I wanna add CSS classes in here. So the first thing that I wanna do is I wanna just show you the easiest way, in my opinion, to do it, and that is using the init method. I think this is the easiest and the best for the fact that it is the easiest, but it's also incredibly flexible uh, for something like this. So what I wanna do is I wanna declare the init function and then run it right away, just like that, All right? So nothing has really changed here other than that I added these two lines. So to add everything else, what I can actually print out is something called self.fields. It's probably not surprising that a form class instance has fields. So this method right here is gonna happen after it's initialized as hopefully you already realized that. And so that of course occurs right here and right here. Both of those create instances of that form. So all of this will run on that view essentially. So if we save this and let's go ahead and open up the terminal, I just wanna see what that print statement looks like. And if I go back into my web page here, run it, what I see is a bunch of things related to my fields here, okay? So I've got my char field for a name, no surprise there. I've got my email field and my email field for the other two, great. So I can actually iterate through these. I can do for field in self.fields. Yes, it is a dictionary here, but 
I could also do this and then print out field. And we refresh, run it again, and there I got my field names here. So what I want to do then is on each one of these, I want to update the CSS class. So that default class, we'll call it default CSS class, is form-control. And the reason I know this is because of Bootstrap. This is what it's been for Bootstrap for some time now. So this is a class I want to add to every single input in a form. So what that will end up looking like is going back into Bootstrap. If you search for forms on there, you'll see form control. It's going to look like this, or one of these at least. And so really what we're doing here is if we look at the inputs right here and here, we see that it adds this class of form control. That's the class we want to add. Of course, our forms right now don't have that class. Here's what they look like, right? And so if for some reason it's collapsed, uncollapse it, and you'll see that each input doesn't have a class name whatsoever. Okay, so let's go back in here and actually append this class name or add it to these widgets. So we're iterating through all of the fields here. So what I can do is self.fields and then the field name dot widget. So the widget is referred to what's actually being rendered here. The first one is a text field or text input. The next one is an email field or really an email input. And the final one is also an email input. So that's what this widget is as it's concerned for Django. We'll see that in a moment. I'll show you the harder way or the more direct way to change the widget itself in a moment. Then I can go ahead and do dot attributes or dot ATTRS that of course stands for attributes. These attributes are related to the various attributes that are on here and the ones that you can modify. So like name equals to required ID and so on. So what I can do is I can actually just update those to some sort of dictionary. So let's go ahead and say new attributes equals to this dictionary. And I'll go ahead and just add in my class being this default CSS class. So if I update these attributes in here, I just pass it that dictionary, save it. This should actually update my classes in here. So if I refresh, there we go. Pretty neat. And we see that form controls on here. Now I can also change the ID on here as well. So right now it says ID underscore name, but perhaps I want to change it to something different. Maybe I just want the ID to be simply the field name. Just like that. And I can refresh in here. What do you know? Now it's the field name. Okay. So this is pretty nice. I can also change the same thing with, let's say placeholder. And, you know, perhaps we want to use that field as well, but maybe we say your field like that, right? We refresh and now it's giving us this. Okay. Now, of course, your email too doesn't make a whole lot of sense in this case, right? That is the field name, but the user shouldn't see that, right? They should see confirm your email or something like that. So let me toggle this terminal down. And so one of the ways we could do that is by adding a condition in here and just saying if field equals to email two, then I can add up the new attributes or replace the placeholder here and say something like confirm your, maybe not field this time, but rather just email, just like that. So we save it, refresh, and there we go. So you might be wondering why is this all like off to the side here? This has to do with how Bootstrap works. So a simple fix for that one is we'll go into base.html. And of course that's in our templates here and around our block content here, I'm just gonna add another div class. Now, before I create this div, let's go ahead and put it around the block content. So this is gonna surround all of that content here. Sometimes you might wanna do this, sometimes not. In this case, I definitely do. And the class that I'm adding is container fluid, which I believe we might have used on um, the nav bar, or actually it comes in there by default, which of what we copied and pasted. So yeah, that's a that's a directly a bootstrap class that just adds a container element around this. So if I refresh in here now, 
it's just a little bit cleaner and there's a little gap on the side now. So going forward, I'll sprinkle in bootstrap things a little bit here and there when it makes sense. This is just a simple one that just aligns our content a little bit better. So now if I, of course, break down my, my page here, it, it is responsive in, in all the best ways, right? I think that's pretty cool. So before I go though, what I wanna do is I wanna take a look at, let's get rid of these print statements here. We don't need them. But I wanna take a look at how to do this sort of manually. This is very programmatic. Manually would be if we actually wrote it in here. So inside of the character field itself. Now I mentioned this widget idea here. So I can actually declare a widget in here directly. And the default one for the character field is a text input, okay? So another one that I could do is text area. And if I save that and refresh on this page, notice that those classes are still being applied, but now my name is a text area. Text areas just allow me to move it around. And of course, inside of a text area, I can add in some additional things as in attributes, rows, let's say two, okay? So it's the same attributes that we see down here. So if I refresh, now it actually changes how those rows are, as in the default number of rows. So let's go ahead and add in, I don't know, 200 and see what that looks like, All right? So quite a bit different. I don't know if that actually, if there's a maximum in here. Let's see, there is a maximum. That's how big it's gonna be based off of form control, I believe. Perhaps not. I don't know. You tell me. Anyways, so we've got the ability to change the widget itself up here. Now, we could also change the widget itself down here, but it doesn't always really make sense to do that. And the only times you really need to change the widget is if you actually do need a text area, if you need this to be much bigger is kind of the point, right? So um, if my name was, instead of being my name, I came in here and I wanted to, to add a new field in here called like bio, that's when I would actually change the widget and I would do it directly in there. And also in here, of course, any sort of attribute that I put down here, I can add in here as well. So attributes being, uh, oops, not a dictionary like that, but attributes being you know class and form control two. So if I save that and refresh, wait a minute, this is, not looking like form control too, but rather form control. So this is where actually hard coding it, the actual class itself up here will be overridden down here. So if that's the case, then you could do field, if field equals to bio, we could then just do continue, right? And in that case, then my CSS class for bio goes away and it goes based off of what I actually added in to the widget itself. Uh, but that's of course more advanced customization if you wanted to play around with it. I'm actually gonna leave the bio out and just leave it like this. This is actually what I'll end up doing. Now one of the big questions of course is like, how do you know which widget to use and what are the widget options and all that? There's a lot of different ways to figure it out, but of course the Django documentation is there. You can click on the widget field here. Um, and what we'll see is a, an actual widgets option. So there's a whole documentation. You, of course, could probably Google search Django Forms widgets, and you'll see all of the various widget options that are here and available to you. Now, there's one more way to actually, actually automatically style these things, and that's a package called Django Crispy Forms. So Django Crispy Forms is really nice for a number of reasons, but one of the things to point out when it comes to Django Crispy Forms, there's a lot of support for all of these other third-party CSS frameworks like Bootstrap, but Bootstrap 5 is something that you'll need to install separate from Django Crispy Forms, which just adds multiple layers when all we really wanted to do was this right here, right? So, so many of your Bootstrap Forms might wanna look like this. Now, when you go back into Bootstrap though, you're gonna look and see, oh, look at this floating labels thing. If I scroll down here, how do I do this, right? So this is quite a bit more advanced and that's where Django Crispy Forms and more specifically Crispy Bootstrap 5 can really shine. 
But again, there's like a whole, we could have a whole course on just Django Crispy forms because there's just so much you can do with it. So if you want to see that, let me know. But of course, this right here, I think is, is great. It's fantastic for what we need. And of course, you could always remove the label here with just saying something like label equals to just an empty string that will actually remove the label from the field itself. And so that's also sometimes something you'll end up seeing. I, nowadays, I like actually keeping the label in because sometimes if the placeholder doesn't render correctly um, or is just like missing or just not that clear, then the actual label, the HTML element of the label is still gonna show up, which I think is also critical. But anyways, so this is one of the great things about Django and Django Forms. If you want more robust Django Forms, Django Crispy Forms, this third-party package is great. There's a number of reasons for that other than the ones I just showed you and mentioned. Uh, but yeah, that's it for styling our Django Forms. Now I have a confession to make. The way we started this project is rarely how I'll ever start projects. The reason being is how we handled forms.py and views.py. Usually I will not put them in the main Django configuration. The only reason I did that is to leave this concept for this part. Now the concept is to take these views, forms, different features or functionality of our project outside of the main configuration folder, but rather into its own component. That component is called an app in Django. So what I wanna do is open up a new terminal window, make sure the virtual environment is activated. We'll navigate into the root of the Django project where manage.py is, and we'll go ahead and create our first component, which is called a Django app. So Python manage.py, start app, and in this case, I'll call it landing underscore pages. Always use snake case with Python, which means underscore and lower cases, just like that. And also on apps themselves, you're gonna to wanna to use plural typically. So instead of saying landing page, you will say landing pages. So anyways, let's go ahead and start that app. And we've got landing pages in here now. Notice that views.py comes in here by default. Forms.py doesn't, but we could always update that as we see fit. So what I actually wanna do is just sort of refactor my project to move all of the views into landing pages and all of the forms into landing pages. So the first thing I wanna do is just drag over forms.py and what VS Code will attempt to do is refactor for us, which in some cases is great. But in this case, I actually don't want it to refactor it because I'm gonna move the view as well. So if I were to refactor it, we can see the preview as to what it's gonna do. It's just updating views.py, the original views.py as to the location where landing pages is. We don't want that anymore. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit discard. So it actually has an error now in views.py because the forms module is no longer there. But of course, like I said, I actually am gonna go ahead and cut out views.py altogether and paste it into my new app component for views.py. So I can actually delete views.py in the configuration folder, which is absolutely something I wanna do. I don't need to muddy up the configuration folder with anything else. So the URLs are something that's also kind of interesting in here as well, because now that I have this landing pages folder, how am I gonna go ahead and implement these URLs? Because they are no longer valid. There's no views.py file in here. So what I can do is I can use from dot dot and then landing pages. We're gonna go ahead and import those views, but this time I'm gonna say, or I'm gonna actually declare them as LP views. And so down here, I will change these to LP views as in landing page views. That way I actually know if I need to import any other components views, I can use this same sort of like structure, if you will, the same sort of uh, pattern to actually import those things so that you're not doing from another you know, component import views as well, where then the two views get sort of muddied up. Now that we've got this, we've got our landing page views in here. I'm actually gonna go ahead and get rid of some of these old ones and save it just like this. Back into my landing pages, I'll also get rid of that ABC page. I no longer need that. Great. So we're really, really close to having our entire landing page component complete. 
But there is one more example of something that I want to change, which is home.html. So yes, it is the home page technically, but I also want to add this into the landing pages directory as well. So you may recall when I do something like this, I need to go into my templates and make a folder for that. So this folder is going to be landing pages too. And then I'll go ahead and drag and move that as well. Okay. So save it, save it and save it. Let's go ahead and make sure our project is still running. In my case, I just have another terminal window in here. Uh, and I got an invalid relative import here. So typically speaking, you actually don't use those two dots when it comes to other apps. You just go ahead and grab directly from that app itself, that app component, so you would get the actual view itself here. You might also try from dot and see what is available. Do two dots and see what is available. But as it said, Django just got mad at you for doing that, for importing it in that fashion. So as LP views, we can comment this one out, save it, and we'll get that same error here. Okay. So Django wants you to import it directly from the module itself, just like this. Great. So now that we've got this going, let's go ahead and actually get an attempt going with our homepage. Let's take a look at that homepage again. It's still working. I can still do hello world, abc at gmail, abc at gmail.com, hit enter, and I cannot use Gmail. Great. So it looks like everything is working as intended. Now, the actual reason I moved everything over in here is because we now want to use models.py, right? So that's the primary reason to eventually start using apps. That's, I mean, yes, I could have kept views and forms in here. I don't normally do that, but the primary reason was to set the stage or the foundation to start using models.py so we can store this data. Now, before I go away though, is when I create apps like this, what I want to do is inside of my settings.py, so I want to scroll up to installed apps. I actually want to add in my app in here. So landing pages. So now Django will know to look inside of these installed apps for a models.py. In other words, I couldn't have just put a models.py inside of CFE home. It wouldn't have necessarily worked to actually create the model I need. I'll come back to that in a little bit, but this is the idea. This is what I will always do when I start projects. I create the project, then I create a component and I put all of the views and functions in that component. Unless of course there was a specific view or a specific HTML page that I just wanted to render really, really quickly, much like what we already did. I would go this route pretty much always creating a component specifically for it. Now I don't call all of my components landing pages. Like that's not something that I typically would necessarily use, but it is a way to illustrate as to how you want to name your components themselves. So now that we've got the app ready to go, let's actually create our first Django model. Let's go ahead and create our first Django model so we can start storing data in our database. And of course we already have a SQLite database here. So that's where we're going to end up storing this data. Now inside of my landing page app here, I'm going to go ahead and open up forms.py and models.py. We can also open up views.py as well. So the general idea here is if I break down the explorer window, I have three different fields in the form that I might want to save. Realistically, I actually only have two fields I want to save and the other two are really for validation, right? So inside of these clean methods here, I'm actually validating one of those fields. I'm actually validating to make sure that my email field is correct. It's like the one that you intend to enter and it's one that I want to accept like on my website, right? So the form itself is actually cleaning up this data for us. It's making sure that it's valid so that we could store it in our database. So what that means is that we actually can use this as a model as to what we want to store in our database. Okay. So let's go ahead and copy this entire form for a moment and put it into models.py and I'll go ahead and comment it out. So we want to think through here what it is that we're going to be doing with this data, right? So I have this form here. I want to use this form as a ground basis for what data I'm going to store in my database. Now the data that comes into your database is going to look a lot like a spreadsheet. 
right? You can think of SQL databases or SQL databases much like you think of a spreadsheet. That is, there's rows, there's columns. These columns have specific data types, data types that we're looking for in terms of what's being entered from our users, right? So name, for example, that's just a character field. That's strings that could be letters, numbers, exclamation marks, you know, different punctuation, all that. This is also true for email fields, actually. The technically speaking from the database, these fields are the same. Now, this is a little bit different than, let's say, like an active field where it's a Boolean value, like true or false. So if we said true, right, that's going to be different than these here. It's not a character field anymore. Uh, another one is an actual number. Let's say, for instance, that we want to put in like their age, right? Let's just pretend for a moment that I'm still 22, right? So that's a number now. That's an integer. That's something that we could actually use, right? So all of these data types actually have an importance on our database. Now, if you're just starting out and you make everything a character field, generally speaking, that's probably fine because you're just learning. So we'll look at how to do that um, with a few character fields, but it's so easy to use the right data type that I'll also show you how to add these things in as well. So let's go ahead and actually do that now in our model. So what I wanna do is first off, declare this model name. Now we can actually stick with a lot of the same sort of concepts from the form. So landing page form now turns into landing page entry. Now the reason it's entry is because it's gonna be a single row. Every time data is being entered, it's gonna be a single row as we'll see in a moment. And this is gonna be instead of forms.form, it's gonna be models.model. Hey, what do you know? That's uh, pretty straightforward. So you might also call it landing page entry model, but I think that's a little bit redundant when it comes to models themselves. So I usually don't have model on there. Forms, on the other hand, I almost always have forms on there. So this actually might be better named landing page entry form, but we'll come back to that in a little bit as well. The naming thing, and just generally speaking, naming things in Django is something you will get better at over time. So don't spend too much time overthinking how to name things. I will mention what I think are best practices, but overall, you should just get it working and then improve your best practices as you get better. So now, how do I actually save these fields? The first question, of course, is do I even want to save all of these fields? Now, I already went over the fact that we probably don't need this third one, email two. We don't need to save that one. Perhaps you want to, but we don't need to do it. So I'm going to omit it for now. Now, so the only fields left are, are the name and email field. Now, I can actually use models.char field and models.email field. Both of these things are valid. Now, the character field, when it comes to storing in the database, we have to add in a few required arguments. The first argument is going to be the max length field, as in how many characters can we actually store in this field. But before I even touch that, I'll just go ahead and save it just like this. And we'll go ahead and open up the terminal back into our running model here. And I get an error showing me that you need the max length attribute. This is the max length argument inside of this character field for this model. Now, a big part of the reason I'm even getting this error has to do with the fact that, well, if I go back into settings up high, this landing page is actually in my installed apps. If I comment that out and save it, I don't see that error anymore. The, the actual views and forms still work, but the model is not being registered in the app at all, which is definitely important. So we're going to go ahead and, and add it back in, save it. And now we see this max length attribute. So the cool thing about modern versions of Django is it does a really, really good job of required fields like this for your models. So back into models.py, I'll go ahead and add in this max length here. So how many characters do you wanna have? So ABC space one, two, three might look like it's only six characters, but just like Twitter, it's actually seven. Spaces do actually count in here. So you wanna be specific about how many characters you want. 50 characters is probably okay. Now, the more characters you allow for, the bigger your actual database can end up being, right? So if you have millions of data points, this does make a difference. Um, if you don't have millions or don't have to plan to have millions anytime soon, 
by all means, put as many characters as you want that your database will allow. 220, whatever. Doesn't really matter as you're learning. It matters once you start scaling, but at that point, there's gonna be a whole lot of other things that matter. But anyways, this is now a valid model form. This is it. We, we finished, <laughs> or rather not a model form, but rather a valid model. Um, yes, we need to actually start using this data, which is something we'll do. We have to handle this you know, unapplied migrations error, this warning that's coming on here. We absolutely need to do something about that, which is something we'll do very soon. But now that we have this model here, what we will attempt to do is store the data in the database from this model. First, we'll start out with just storing the data directly from this view here. Then we'll go ahead and introduce the concept of something called a model form, which is pretty fantastic. In many ways, Django was built specifically to help manage SQL databases. That's SQL databases. So by default, it actually integrates really well with a number of SQL databases, SQLite, Postgres, MySQL. You can read all about them on the Django documentation. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is that SQL databases, like many things, many types of structured databases, we actually have to tell it what we want to have happen with our data. Now, to illustrate this concept, we'll go back into this landing page data spreadsheet that I created on Google Sheets, right? So at this point, I have just these columns here, name and email, right? So that is what's gonna correspond specifically to this model, name and email. Sure, I have some arguments in here, maybe, maybe not, but the general idea is that's what I'm trying to do here. Now, before I could even start adding name or email or having entries in here, I literally had to open up Google Docs and then create a brand new database or spreadsheet called landing page. In there, I had to do a new table and this table is gonna be, you know, landing page entries or something along those lines, right? So I actually have to be very specific about this. If I wanna have a, another table in here, I have to create it. Let's say for instance, products and so on, right? And so I can switch back and forth and all this stuff. Now, Django has to do something very similar, except we're not doing it with a user interface, we're gonna do it automatically using two built-in commands for Django. So those built-in commands are python manage.py, make migrations, hit enter. What this does is we see it says create model landing page entry. Now, if we look in the code itself, we've got this new folder in here called migrations. We can click on this folder, and this has this thing called migrations.createModel. Now, all that's happening in here is Django is preparing to let a SQL database know what we want to store. That's it. It's gonna create a new table in a SQL database, or it wants to do that, and then it's gonna go ahead and add the different columns, in our case, fields, into that table. And again, think of it conceptually, much like this spreadsheet here. We've got a whole database, which we could call this db.sqlite3, as far as Django is concerned. Uh, but of course, I'm gonna leave it in just simply as landing page. Um, but now we also have our, we wanna have name and email as two different columns in here. Cool. So how do we actually make that change happen? Well, to do this, we run python manage.py migrate. Now, before I run this command, I will mention that there is gonna be more than just our single create landing page entry here because we've never run this command before. So I hit enter and all of these things happen, right? So it's applying all of these changes. What's happening here is it's making database modifications into db.sqlite3. Now, all of these database modifications are happening because in our settings.py for Django, we have a lot of default applications that are coming through. We have Django's admin application, we have Django's authentication application, which also includes users, content types, sessions, messages, and so on. And then also our application, which only has one single model, which of course is the landing page entry, that one single model corresponds to one single table in a SQL database. Now, this might be kind of confusing to you, and it becomes a lot less confusing, I think, once we start using the Django admin, which we'll do in the next one. But for now, we've got 
the model actually in here and we've updated our database. Now, what if we actually just removed our database? db.sqlite3 and that's it, right? My database is gone. If I rerun the server, control C and rerun the server, two things are gonna happen. That error is still there and a new database gets created. Now this is because of my settings in settings.py. If I scroll down to those databases, I'm using a SQLite database. Django will create this database for me. It's not the most secure database. I don't think it's exactly a production database. There's some debate to that, but it's definitely not like MySQL or Postgres where we'll have to do a little bit more manual work to get that database working. It's not a whole lot more, but it is a little bit more. So at this point though, we have the ability to run our migrations again. So notice it says you have 19 unapplied migrations. So let's go ahead and actually comment out our landing page app. I'm gonna scroll back up, I'm gonna comment this out, save it. And so now it says you have 18, right? Cause I removed one of the models themselves or more specifically, I removed the landing page app. So it's not looking in these migrations anymore. That's the migration that's not applied. It actually has little to do with the model itself, but rather this migration hasn't run. So again, if we wanna run it, we run python manage.py and migrate. This creates the database for us and gets all of the things that are default to Django. If we wanna bring back in our application, save this. Now, if I go to run migrations, it's gonna run that single migration, landing pages.0001 initial. Hey, what do you know? 001 initial, which could have multiple operations in here. In this case, it only has one. Now to get into the nitty gritty of all these things is something left for a, another time. But what we can see is this actual create model is creating three fields, not just two. Look back at our model. We only declared two fields in here. This one's creating three. Now SQL databases, just generally speaking, will need an ID field of some kind. In this case, it is that primary key. It's, it's gonna automatically create new IDs for every entry that comes in. Again, we'll see this in action once we get into the admin, but the actual spreadsheet that we had here is also showing some of this data here, which is pretty cool. So it also has the ID field, if you will, by, by declaring the row name to some degree. It's not identical, but that's just generally the idea here. So what I still wanna do is of course, add some data into our database. And then I also wanna review that data. And then I want to modify how the model is. Now, this is a multi-step process because of how Django works and specifically how the models work because it's not going to be as flexible as a spreadsheet because it's not a spreadsheet. It's made to store thousands upon thousands of data points, if not millions, if not potentially billions of data points. Spreadsheets aren't made for that. I think if you get 2000 rows in a spreadsheet, performance starts to degrade quite a bit. In Django and SQL databases, that's not gonna be the case, especially with production grade ones. Now we're gonna go ahead and manage some of our data with this landing page entry model. We're gonna do this by using the Django admin. So it's one of the first installed apps that you'll have in your Django project. And you also might remember in urls.py, it's one of the first paths that's activated by default because it actually is pretty fundamental to managing your data inside of a Django project. So let's go ahead and make sure that our project is running and then navigate over into slash admin. And what's gonna happen is, when you do that, it's going to prompt you to log in. Now, as you recall, we actually haven't created any users at this point. So how do we do that? Now, luckily for us, Django has built-in commands for this. So if we go back into a, our root of our project, of course, where manage.py is with an activated virtual environment, we're gonna go ahead and run python manage.py, create super user and hit enter. Now you can name this username however you'd like. In my case, I'll leave it in as CFE. You don't have to put in a password or rather an email address. You do have to put in a password, but when you type it, it's not gonna show up, right? It's literally the only field or the only input there that won't show up. But in my case, I just gave a whatever password and I kept the username CFE. 
So now going back into the admin, I can type in CFE and then that password that I put in and log in. Pretty neat. Okay. So before I go any further with that, let's just do it again. I'm going to go ahead and delete this SQLite database and I'll try to create that super user again. Wait a minute. No such table. Well, of course there's not. We deleted the database and we didn't run python manage.py migrate. So deleting the database is totally fine, especially as you're learning. In fact, you should probably get used to doing it when you're learning because, well, it's going to happen a lot. So in this case, I ran it and what do you know, it applied all those migrations. So it prepared my Django managed database for me. So now I can run that create super user command again. And if I want to write out my username, by all means, you can add an email if you want as well. And there we go. Okay. So now that I've got that, and of course my server is still running, I'm going to go ahead and jump back into the admin. The session ended because I deleted the database. So I need to re-log in and start a new session. And here we go. So I can already manage users in here. I can manage user groups as well, but we'll leave that for another time. Users in here, I can add users and do all sorts of stuff. Right off the bat, this hopefully excites you. Now, it's not the same as user registration, like what your web app would end up doing, but it is pretty great if you want to start adding staff users on here to manage some of your data as well. Now, the Django admin itself should be used just for your staff. Your end users, like if you're starting to have thousands and thousands of users, they should not be using the Django admin. Just your staff members, that's what it's designed for. Django can do all sorts of things for your end users, which is what we've been building towards and we'll come back to as well. So let's go ahead and actually add our model, this landing page entry model into the Django admin. It is incredibly simple. So back into our landing page app here, we're gonna go into admin.py. We'll go ahead and do a relative import. So from dot models, we're gonna import that landing page entry. With that, we'll just go ahead and register this with admin.site.register, putting in that model there, save it just like that. Again, make sure that the server is running and then we'll go ahead and jump back into the admin itself, refresh in here and what do you know? It says landing page, oh, that's funny, entries spelled incorrectly. Nevertheless, we will jump in here and add one. And I'll go ahead and say Justin ABC at gmail.com. Hit save. I got a landing page entry object, but what do you know? It's saved in there. Let's do another one. Another at another.com. And so on. So I now have entries that are being saved. This is great. And hey, what do you know? It actually corresponds a little bit to our actual landing page. Not completely, but it's close. So of course we need to map those two things together and we will, but the point of this was to actually look at the Django admin and see how powerful and nice it is to actually manage some of these things. Now, before I go though, I want this to not say landing page entry object. Instead, what I wanna do is just change the str method of our model. So in models.py, what I could do in here is define str and I can return back a string related to the model itself, just like that. So here's a new core tenant. Whenever we change a model, we need to run two commands, something related to the migrations and then something to migrate. So what that means is I run Python manage.py, make migrations. Think of that as preparing the database and then Python, oops, and then back in here, Python manage.py migrate and hit enter. Now, nothing actually changed in here at this time, but whenever you change your models on Pi, it's a really good idea to run both of those commands so that your database and models are synced up. I will definitely say that again, but for now, we've changed that str method. If we go back into the admin, we now see some of this data coming through here. Now, there is more customization that we can absolutely do with the admin. I'll just give you a little glimpse as to what you can do right now with saying class landing page entry admin, and this is admin.model admin. What we can do in here is we can say something like list display, 
And now I can actually change what's being displayed in that, that list page. We can do name and email, and then I can use this in here. Of course, in this case, name and email correspond directly to these fields here. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that. We'll go back into the admin. Notice that it says landing page entry up here. If I refresh it, it says name, so the actual field itself, and also email. So now I have both of these things in here. They're still linked, you just click on the name. But now I've got all of this data, which is fantastic. The next thing is I can also do um, search fields, and I can say name and email, save that as well, refresh in here, and now I've got a little search bar in here, like another at gmail.com. Notice I spelled it incorrectly. Uh, so we can actually go ahead and do another. Also, this time, well, maybe it's not at Gmail, so I can get rid of the at Gmail, and what do you know? It actually gives me a result. So now we've got just like management possibilities, like really, really high. It's, it's pretty great, I think. Um, so yes, there's a lot more you can do with the admin itself, and there's a lot more time that you could spend really discussing many, many different layers of the admin. But even what we just did here as a core functionality early on, I think is just something that is fantastic. Um, so we're in a really, really good spot with this admin stuff. Now, before we actually make changes to the models, what I want to do is be able to actually add in entries from the view now that we can actually review them inside of the admin. All right, so now it's time to be able to combine my landing page form, my model, and my view to actually store this data. Now we've already seen this data with this form clean data. And so we can actually know that the name is in form.cleanedata.get and name. And then email is basically the same thing here, like that. And so how do we, of course, add those things into a model? It's pretty easy. So let's go ahead and grab the model itself. So we'll do from.models import the landing page entry model, okay? And so there's a couple different ways how we can look at this. First off, we could do obj equals to this. We initialize a version or an object of this. We set obj.name equaling to name. We set obj.email equaling to email. And then we run obj.save, okay? So that's actually how we can create this. Now, another way we could create this, obviously very similar to this, is by saying obj equals to landing page entry dot objects dot create and name equals to name, email equals to email. Now, on one hand, this is of course Django specific. The class name dot objects is 100% Django, then dot create also Django. Whereas the second one was more Pythonic. Whereas like we created a instance of this class and then we named some of the attributes of that class with the values that came from the form. So both of these can be done actually at the same time. So I could also do obj.email is equal to email and then obj.save. Um, now in this case, it's actually gonna set the same exact email um, and it's not a very practical use case right here, but that is multiple ways on how we could actually go about doing this. I'm gonna leave out this one um, just for your own reference. Okay, so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and actually create some data here. Your name is, this is my name, it's Justin. And abc at justinjustin.com. And we'll go ahead and confirm that. We'll hit send. And then in my landing page, what do you know? This is my name and it's Justin. Okay, and so we could try again, again, at, again, right? And submit that form again, refresh in here, what do you know? So it's now working, congratulations, you have now created a successful Django model. In fact, we've now laid down the foundation of what Django is all about, which is the MVT, that is model view template. That is the type of framework it is. So you may have heard of MVC, model view controller. This is model view template. 
So really, we've rounded out the best of web applications out there. So we have a model, we have a view, and we have templates, and we can now combine all three to actually store data in the database. Now, getting that data out and displaying it is a whole other thing that we'll talk about soon. Uh, but generally speaking, this is pretty straightforward and pretty easy, I think, at this point. Now, can things be more advanced and more customized? Absolutely. One of the things I will do is update our form to be more advanced and more customized. That is to use something called model forms to just make things even more simple for us, which is what we'll do in just a moment. But just generally speaking, we have a model here and perhaps we wanna add data to this model, perhaps not, but overall we can now store data based off of this model. Now at this point, the reason we use a different kind of form setup is the fact that we are writing a lot of code here for something that's gonna be pretty common to do with data that's tied to a model, that is form data that's tied to a model. So we need to look at something called model forms. Now what we're gonna do is combine the best of regular Django forms with the best of Django models using something called a model form. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and copy this landing page form the entire thing, and we'll paste it right above. This time I'm gonna call this landing page entry model form. It's a lot more explicit because of, well, just the nature of what we're trying to do, which is take the landing page entry model and then create a form out of it. So to create the form out of it, we use instead of forms.form, we use forms.model form. Now model form itself requires a meta class. This meta class requires us to do the model and the fields that we wanna use. Now we already know the fields, they're actually listed right here. The fields are gonna be name and email. Now of course we can ignore the, this email too, just mentally ignore it for a moment, but really change nothing else other than bringing the model in. So we'll go ahead and do from.models, import the landing page entry and declare that. Now, if you're curious, meta classes typically describe the things that may need to happen on the parent class, right? So in this case, I'm not actually adding these fields in here. I'm just describing to the parent class what needs to happen. But by default, model forms need at least these two items here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this right here. So this is now our form. So the intuition might be like, oh, wait a minute, is it just gonna be the email to the confirm email or is it gonna be something different? So I'll go ahead and copy this and we'll bring it into our view here. And so inside of forms, I'm gonna go ahead and import this landing page model form and we will go ahead and get rid of the landing page form itself. And we'll just go ahead and replace the instances of it just like that. Okay, so at this point, this is still valid. This actually will work like this, as in it will absolutely create a new entry for me. Let's take a look at what ends up being rendered. So if we go into our form on the view and refresh, let's make sure we don't have any errors with our server running. And it looks like I do. And back into our forms here. Oh, this should be fields, plural, not field as we see here. So let's go ahead and do that and rerun that server. Looks like we don't have errors now. Let's refresh. Okay, great. Every once in a while, you know, even the best of us miss little things like S's all the time. I am one of those people and yeah. So anyways, we've got the form here now. So I'll go ahead and say model form is here, exclamation mark, model at models.com and go ahead and send that look in the admin and what do you know, it's still working. Okay, so we haven't really changed anything though. If we think about our view, it's just using a different form name in here. But a couple of things that are important on the model form itself, what happened was, is it actually used that original email to field, but it also included our other fields that come directly from the this these fields right here, the model itself. So a model form will inherit the field properties, the actual form field properties from the model itself, which is how I was able to declare this 
and not need these things right here, right? So I can save that just like that, which is pretty nice. And so the clean method should also still work for both things. The clean email method should also still work. So let's go ahead and give those a shot. So Gmail test, abc at gmail.com, copy it, and there we go. So again, it's still working exactly like the original form did, but now it's using the model form. So those are attributes of it. If we need to add additional fields in here, we totally can. And this is how we just literally add them in. And it's just that simple. All of the fields we need that are related to the model itself, we declare in the meta tag, essentially. So if we save this, refresh in here, notice that we've got all of these confirm emails here now, which of course are not something that I actually want. But we can save it with the data we actually want, with the fields we actually want, and then go back into the view. This is actually where the things get the most interesting. And that is if I comment all of this out now and do obj equals to form.save and just print out what obj is, we can save that. And then let's go ahead and run this form again. And I'll call this taco, taco at taco.com and go ahead and send it. Go back into our landing page, refresh in here. What do you know? There's taco in there. It actually ended up working. And if I open up the terminal window, it will also print out that str method from my view as well. So this is yet another way to store data. This is the much preferred way of the two if you need to store only one model. If you need to store more than one model, you can still do this method, but then just have a bunch of other field data in here, which in other words is I can now say my other field data is equal to form.cleaneddata.get and email to. And then of course I could actually end up using that for some other model to create it right here if we needed to. Um, or we just need it for validation purposes is what we did. We did it for validation only. We didn't actually store this data whatsoever, which is fantastic. So we've got all sorts of really cool things with our model that's coming in in here uh, that just isn't available otherwise. So yeah, if you have questions on model forms, let me know. Like many things in Django, they can get a lot more complicated than, than just this. But overall, that's pretty cool. Now, one of the challenges that I do want to mention that you might have is coming back to this name field here and saying required being false. So let's take a look at this example before we go and see what we need to do now. And that is ABC, or let's leave that empty and I'll do ABC at ABC.com. So this is now a valid form, except Hmm, what do you know? It actually saved that data in here, right? I actually can't select it, but it did save that data. What if I try to do that same thing in the admin? So in the admin, same sort of field here, abc at gmail.com, or, or yeah, gmail is a good example too, but let's go ahead and do abc at abc.com. Hit save and continue. It's giving me this field is required. So there's a disconnect actually between what the form is attempting to do and what the model needs, right? So this is certainly one of the potential downsides as to how you design your forms and models. So just keep that in mind when you're doing these things. Now, the big question would be is like, oh, well, how do I allow for this to be changed so that it can have no name and just an email? That is something that we'll do when we actually modify our Django models. We can add fields, we can modify attributes of them. Now we're gonna go ahead and learn how to modify our Django model. As you learn Django, you will run into instances where you didn't really design your model that well. Perhaps you want more data. Now I certainly want more data on here, but I also want to adjust it. Like I no longer want the name field to be required. So that's the first thing that I wanna cover. Now that is, we can say blank equals to true in here, which allows for this field to be blank. Now, whenever you make a change to models.py, I've mentioned this before, is you run two commands, python manage.py make migrations. 
Now, of course, what Make Migrations does is it doesn't change the field itself, but instead it prepares Django to tell our database about what we want to change with the field. And what we see here is it's trying to alter this field to have this blank equaling to true. After you do that, we run python manage.py, migrate, hit enter, now that has actually changed. Now what comes as a result, assuming our server is running, is I can jump into the admin specifically for blank, go back into add, notice that it's no longer bold, but now I can do abc at abc.com, hit save and continue, and what do you know? It actually did create it. So as the admin is currently situated, I can't actually select those items. So a quick switch for that is just the order of the display here. And that is to put email first. And now I should be able to select those entries here. So there is one more field that I might want to add. And that is when did this actually occur? So that field is a timestamp field. So typically speaking, I will put a timestamp field on any model that it makes sense to know when it was added into the database. Every once in a while, I'll also create a field that is related to the last time this was updated, like saved at all. Um, now, in this case, we won't need that because the entry itself should pretty much never really be updated. So the timestamp is the key one here. Now there's two different kinds of built-in fields that Django has for timestamps. We can do a date only field, as in the date it was updated, or we can do a date time field, which is the date and the time, which is what I wanna use. So to do that, we do models.date time field. And there are some required arguments in here. If I just save it, I believe the errors might start to show up on the running model. Looks like it doesn't. Uh, but the actual arguments that are required here are pretty interesting. So let's do a quick search for Django date time field. And we want to look for the model field reference. I'll do another quick search on this page with command F and jump over to the date time field. Now I know these fields like the back of my hand because I use them so often. But notice there's auto now false and auto add now false. So these are the required arguments that we need to add in. This is always true uh, for the documentation. It will always show you the required arguments that are in there. And so I'm gonna go ahead and pass these arguments in and explain auto now versus auto now add. Updated, let's go ahead and use it in terms of the other field or the other use case. Let's go ahead and add in updated as in the last time this model was saved, we wanna update that time. That is auto now being true. When we actually enter it into the database, that is auto now add being true. That means that this field of course is gonna automatically be updated for us based off of the database, both of these fields actually. So I'm gonna actually save these. In most cases, I would never actually have an updated field in the entry because it's just not necessary. But well, you totally could. So now let's, with these things saved, let's actually run, what do we have to run? We change the models up high. Remember, it's simple, two commands, make migrations, and whoa, wait a minute, I got a new error here. What's this error? It's impossible to add the field timestamp without providing a default. Okay, so we need to have a default for all existing rows. So here is one of the inherent challenges to using SQL databases. Now, to understand this a little bit better, I'm gonna jump back into the spreadsheet itself. Let's go ahead and add in, I'm just gonna do a few things here just with names. So J, A, B, C, D. Okay, so here's all of my data, J, A, B, C, D. If I were to add a new field in a spreadsheet, something like email, not a big deal because I just added a new column and the spreadsheet doesn't care. Now, when it comes to big databases, they do care. They wanna know what these values should be by default because by default, they cannot be empty unless you declare that, unless you allow them to be empty. Now, when I say empty, I don't mean blank, blank being true. Blank has to do with what's being entered into the field. What I actually mean is null. So null means that it can be absolutely null 
the term of null in the database. It's not the same thing as a empty string, right? Sometimes it's referred to as that, but it's not. Null means null. And that's why this error is happening. So we don't have a default or null. So we can provide one, a default right now, to add on all existing rows. In other words, to update this to whatever values that we're trying to have as the default. But instead of it being arbitrary like this, it would be basically the same default, right? That's kind of the point of a default value. Or we could actually provide a one-off inside of the Python shell, which is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and say one, hit enter. Now I can actually add in a default. Now notice that we can use timezone.now as the accepted default value. Now, you might not know what timezone.now is, but we realize that timezone.now is a date time module. So that means that these are daytime fields. It's safe to bet that timezone.now is something we can use on them. It's actually why I use these as an example to start. So I can just hit enter, and now both of these fields as a default will use that timezone.now. And we can see this in the migration itself. Here's the actual default. And auto now doesn't need a default because it will be based off of when it's saved in the database. The only one that needs the default is the timestamp field because of this value right here, because it'll never have a value in the, the database. Pretty interesting. So now that we've got that, we'll go ahead and do python manage.py migrate, hit enter. And now if we look in our admin, let's go back into our admin we could go into one of these fields and click on it and not see the actual data. So this has to do with just the general design of the Django admin itself. So in the admin, what I can do then is I can say read only fields and I can actually set all of the read only fields. I can set literally all of them. In fact, for this type of you know data, maybe that's what I want is to have all of them in here. I can have timestamp and updated. So we save that and refresh into our page here. Oh, read only is one word actually, just like that. So let's refresh in here and now we can actually see the timestamp when it occurred as well as when it was most recently updated. If I hit save and continue, notice that recently updated just happened. So of course in my list display, I can also put the timestamp in here, which is also pretty fantastic. I can also do something called a list filter, which includes that timestamp field. Now, if it was a date field, that would also still work. So date time field or a date field, all of the things that we just did will work with everything we just did, which you could try out. So now with that, if I come back into my landing page entries, I see the timestamp in here, and I can also see that I can filter it down uh, by the that data, which is really, really cool. So modifying Django projects is easy to do. Modifying Django models can get a little wonky, can get a little bit challenging to do because if you are gonna delete a field like updated and you run make migrations, you might see errors like this, right? And the reason that error is coming up is because of the admin using that field. So we need to get rid of that field, save it, run it again, and now it's going to attempt to remove that field, right? This of course is gonna delete all of the data from that column in your database. It's not a whole lot different than just going in and deleting the database itself other than it's just for one single column instead of all of the data in your database. But now it's gone, it's gone for good. And so if I refresh in here, I can't, there's no updated field in there whatsoever. And so if I were to try and bring it back, I totally could, I totally could bring it back. But now all of that data is, well, it has changed. It has been modified. That's something that's really easy to accidentally do because all you're doing here is commenting out a field and then you run make migrations and migrate and you're done, right? So it's actually really important to understand that this is definitely error prone but it's certainly one of the most efficient ways to store this data on Django. But it's also something that to keep in mind as to why you wanna have regular backups 
running and stuff like that inside of your project. So that is critical with this. But now we've got a way to save data in our database. We have a way to modify how we store that data. Of course, I could add other kinds of fields on here as well. Like let's say for instance, a Boolean field, right? So a Boolean field is simply active equals to models dot Boolean field. This time I usually just put a default in. With that default, when I go to run the migrations, it just creates that default for me. All of the fields in there are now default being true. Now, in this case, active doesn't really make a whole lot of sense other than maybe they got a email to activate their email and there's a way to update all this data and stuff like that. That of course is outside the context of what we're trying to do here. The point being is changing the models is something you'll do a lot, but something else you'll do, especially as a beginner, is mess this up a lot and that's okay. How do you actually recover from messing it up? Well, one of the ways is to assume that your database data is, well, not gonna be great for a long time. So just be prepared to be able to delete it. That's okay. Delete that database. And then you can delete all of the migrations that you have in here. Other than the init file, you could delete all of these migrations and just start anew with whatever code you want. You could always just create a new app as well. But what you wanna do is just play around with these different fields because once you have a full understanding of how they work and you've seen how to remove them, how to add them and all that, you'll get a lot more comfortable with it. Now, this is one of the inherent downsides of using a SQL based technology, which is essentially what Django is. It's not like NoSQL. NoSQL is a lot more flexible and we wouldn't talk about migrations at all with NoSQL. Well, in some cases you might a little bit, but overall it's just like way different of a programming paradigm. So with SQL databases, there is very rigid structure that we need to follow. Although we can be, still be creative in that structure, knowing that we can clean up data later. But it's really important to get the data right early so we don't ever have to clean it up for a number of reasons, uh, which is outside the context of this course. But one of them being doing massive query sets and doing searches, like filtering down all of our data. Um, that is something else. That's something that would become important as you start to build your project more and more. But anyway, so now that we've got this, there's a couple other things that we need to do to ensure that this model is pretty good. And part of it is related to tests. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and create an automated test for this landing page entry. Now, an automated test is as simple as writing Python manager.py test and running it. This can save us a lot of headache in the future, some of which are related to migrations, right? So if we actually change a field name on accident, like active d, we accidentally did that, saved it, ran migrations, did all those things, running Python manage.py test will stop us in our tracks or at least help us solve that problem. And so I'm just gonna show you a incredibly basic way to do it first, then we'll add a sort of backup way as well, using backup data that is. Um, so what we wanna do is jump into tests.py in our landing page here. We're gonna go ahead and import our model. So from.models import our landing page entry. And we're gonna go ahead and do class landing page entry test case. And it's gonna take in test case by default. We're gonna define a setup method. The setup method is in camel case. And we're gonna go ahead and create our first entry. So it's gonna be as simple as landing page entry objects create. And I'm gonna add in all of the fields I wanna use. So name being Justin, email being abc at gmail.com and then we'll go ahead and do active being false okay so with tests they're pretty straightforward you define test underscore and then give it a name the name is completely arbitrary but just give it one so what i want to do is say test inactive that's it i'm just going to test inactive something here so what do I mean by inactive? Well, that is getting all of the items here that are inactive. In my case, only one, it says false. So what I wanna do here is also introduce a way to query our database. So we're gonna learn a couple of different things 
related to the data itself. So querying our database is we can say our OBJ list is equal to this landing page entry dot objects dot all. This gives us a list of all of our objects in the database, a list just like that. So this list, we could narrow it down a little bit by saying, let's say our inactive items. And in here, I'll use a list comprehension and just do x for x in obj list if x dot or if not x dot active. Don't worry if you don't understand this, we're gonna make a much better version in a moment. And then what I wanna do is I wanna assert that the length of this is equal to one. Okay, this is such a mess, but let's come back to it. So why do I know that it's one? Well, I only created one entry here. After I created that one entry, I actually run the test. So let's go ahead and run this. So we'll go ahead and do Python manage.py, manage.py, test, hit enter, it runs one test. If I change this to being two, run it again, it fails. Right? It's not two, it's one, okay? So what I can do with Django is change this quite a bit. This is sort of okay, but I can do it better. I can say QS equals to the landing page entry objects dot all, but instead of dot all, I can do filter. And this allows me to narrow the results, narrowing it by some value. So in this case, I wanna narrow it by active being false, okay? So literally this field here, okay? So that narrowing also happens with this list filter, right? So if I came back in here and said active on the admin itself, I could come back, save that. Let's go jump into the admin real quick, refresh in here and notice that I've got active. I can say no, which is the same thing as saying false, or I could say yes which is the same thing as saying true. Cool. So that's essentially what I'm doing with that filter. The same thing as the admin does. These can get a lot more complicated than this, but for now, I'll just leave it in at that. So QS is a shorthand for writing query set list, or just simply query set. So we'll leave it in as query set. Now, yet again, I can actually write a list comprehension like this, but it's not necessary. Instead, what I could do is assert that qs.count is equal to one. So this is a query set method for Django to check how many items are in this query set, how many items fit this filter. So yet again, it's going to be, what do you know? One, it's gonna actually work. Now, another thing with Django is we don't necessarily need to a assert this, but I can run something like self dot assert equal and QS dot count being one, right? Or what I could do here is put it up here and say the inactive count equals to one or more simply self dot inactive count equals to one. And now I can use that assert here. Now, the reason we do something like this has to do with the fact that maybe you start setting up a lot more data in here that requires our test to be a little bit more resilient to the amount of data that I end up setting. A good example of this would be to say that I want my inactive count to be three. So then I could do four I in range, zero and self dot inactive count, or let's go ahead and use that right there. And then run that create command. This time, the inactive data will still remain to be correct. So we run it again, still correct because of how I'm using these different variables. Okay, so this is great for a number of reasons. One of them being, if I came into my models, went in and got rid of inactive or active, ran python manage.py make migrations, hmm, I don't need this field anymore. Well, I got that list filter issue, okay, cool. We saw that last time, let me get rid of that. Let me run this again, and what do you know? And then I'm gonna go ahead and run python manage.py migrate. Everything's looking good, let me push it into production. Wait, wait, before I do that, 
we run Python manage.py test, hit enter, and errors, unexpected keyword arguments active. What did I do? So this is, of course, not that realistic of an example, but it's certainly something that does happen. And this is a reason to learn source control or version control. So you can actually see that, oh yeah, uh, I've removed the active field. I need to bring that back. So I want to revert back my, let's discard those changes. Uh, we might also need to remove the, the migrations that was in there, um, but I'm gonna have to leave it in my case as the teacher because, uh, well, I want that example showing up. So I'll go ahead and make migrations and bring it back in. And now I'll run those tests again. And what do you know, it's, the tests are passing again. Okay, great. So, you know, writing tests can get a lot more complicated than this, but the point that I wanted to show you was, number one, it's a good idea to write tests and it's a good idea to write them frequently. Number two, when you do change these fields, they might have catastrophic effects on your system. So making sure that you're testing them is probably a good idea. So that's kind of the gist of this. Now, I do also wanna show you how to test just a little bit more, um, and that is by using something called fixtures. But overall, like I said, testing your code is a really good idea because it makes things more stable, but also it can save you a ton of headache in the future. And this also ho hopefully means that you're gonna adopt using version control in your products in the future as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at fixtures. Now, if you're anything like me, you're gonna be dropping your development databases all the time. You know, perhaps it's an issue with migrations or perhaps you created an app you just simply don't want anymore. And for some reason, the database is having issues. So that is one of the reasons why I use Django fixtures is that I can actually dump out all of the data from the database that Django could then reread and bring right back into the database. That's one thing but I can also use it in tests as well. So instead of setting up data like this, I can just use test data through something called a fixture. Now to generate fixtures, just run python manage.py, dump data, hit enter, and this actually creates JSON data for you, that's J-S-O-N data for you of your entire database. Now you might not always want your entire database, instead you might wanna be specific to the app that you want to dump. So in my case, let's say landing pages. If I had enter here, it only has data that's related to the landing pages, not to everything else, like my users and all that stuff, right? So the other dump data command will get your users as well, which is nice, but not something I need right now. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna dump this data landing pages. And where I wanna put it is inside of my landing pages app itself into a fixtures directory. Right, so inside of there. So we're gonna go ahead and do landing pages and then we'll use the greater than sign. We're gonna put it into landing pages slash fixtures slash, we can call it whatever we want, right? So we can call this entry data dot JSON, hit enter, and that will actually create all of that data, just like that. Pretty neat. So there's ways to format it and stuff like that, but that's that data. So we can also load that data in with python manage.py load data, and then the path to wherever it is, which is just like, oops, load data. I think I copied the wrong thing. So let's go ahead and python manage.py load data. Let's go ahead and just grab the, copy this relative path here with the right click or control click. And we can get rid of that SRC there. Hit enter, and there we go. So it installs those objects from that one fixture. Now it's not actually going to install anything because that data is already in there, but it would if the data was gone or the database was deleted, right? And so you could do this with your users as well. So let's say for instance, if I come back up to my users, what I would do is python manage.py dump data and let's call this auth.user. And again, we'll put it in landing pages, that's fixtures users.json, hit enter. And if we look in there, we now see, well, it's just one user. It's that one single user that I had and whether or not they're staff. So again, we could load that data with that same method. Cool. So why did I have both of these things? Why do I have users and entry data? Well, on one hand, I probably wouldn't really ever put my users fixture 
inside of my landing pages, unless of course I needed them in my tests. Okay, so what this means is jumping back into my test now, what I can do is I can declare the fixtures I want to use. So entry-data.json and users.json, okay? And so with that now, what I wanna do is I'm gonna go ahead and do test active being self. And again, my query set is roughly the same as this up here. Okay, and then active being true. This time I'm just gonna go ahead and do self assert equal or rather assert greater and equal, which is the same thing as saying greater than or equal. So QS.count. And I think I had at least five. So let's go ahead and put greater than or equal to five. Now I have a test that has nothing to do with setup, but rather has something to do with fixtures. So I'll go ahead and run python manage.py and test, hit enter, and now it runs. Pretty great. So if you were curious, it does create a test database and then it destroys that test database, which is nice. So the, de the testing database does not persist it can, there is a way to persist it, but we're not gonna do that. Instead, we're gonna continue with these fixtures, which essentially is a test database. And what we see is it has more than five active items in this entry. Uh, but of course, if I put 100 here, it's probably gonna fail because my fixture just simply does not have 100. It has 10, right? And so coming back into five, we're good to go. Pretty nice. So I can also test that there are users in here as well. Now, the way we do this is by getting the user model itself. So first off, we do from django.contrib.auth, we're gonna import get user model. Now, I personally recommend that you remember this is how you get the user model because it's what I do all the time. So we're gonna go ahead and get the user model and initialize it. And now I just want to test users exist. And again, we'll do a query set for user.objects.all. And now I'll just do assert true. And that's qs.exists. That's another query set method on whether or not there's even anything in here. So you could also do that test exists on all of the other query sets as well if you needed to, okay? So we run this again, and this time it ran three tests related to users, related to you know uh, the actual landing pages being active and the ones being inactive. So as we see here, we now understand that we can use fixtures. These fixtures can help us with all kinds of things related to our data and our database, um, including just deleting the database altogether and then reloading these fixtures in. Um, and also that we can test data based off of this. Does it mean that we can't still generate data inside of our tests? We definitely can, but it does mean that we have a little bit more robust of a way to do that testing. So we could spend days and days and days on testing. There's a lot of things that we still would want to test in a real production environment. One of them would be our homepage here, uh, but I'm actually not gonna spend any more tests uh, at this time or time on test at this time, mainly because, um, well, there's just a lot to it that we would end up needing to do that I do encourage you to research on your own. Tests aren't always considered to be the most fun of things to do. So there's a couple more concepts that I wanna cover prior to finishing off this project. Now what I'm gonna do is create a view to list out all of the items that are stored in our database. So I'm gonna define a new view function here. I'm actually gonna just copy the one right above it for the home page, and we'll call this our landing page entry list view. I'm gonna get rid of basically everything in here except for maybe the context. And so what we want for our context is slightly different here. I'm gonna go ahead and declare a query set for the landing page entry model with objects.all. So I'm gonna get all of those. This of course is a query set as we mentioned with the testing, but we wanna make sure that it is a proper model. The context itself, I'm gonna come in here and call it an object list. 
Now, this has to do with learning other things about Django at some point. So I'll leave it in as object list just to prepare you for that. Now, you could call it query set. You could call it list or items, but I'm going to leave it in as object list. The template name itself, I would just call it list.html as well. Also in the landing page template directory. So we'll come in here and do list.html. And then my homepage, I'll just go ahead and copy that again. Paste in here and I'll just call this entries and entries. Okay. And so I want to actually iterate through that object list. So of course I could just write out object list like this. That would give me that context object here, which of course is the query set. But I could also iterate through here to iterate in a Django template. First off, I'll declare a unordered list HTML element. Inside of here, I'll go ahead and do for object in object list, just like that, curly brackets for. This is of course a variable name, so you could call it ABC if you'd like. And then we are gonna go ahead and do in for. And then inside of here, I'll give a list element and we'll do object.email and then dash object.name and maybe even object.timestamp. Great. So now that we've got this list as, as well as this view, I need to create a URL for it. So inside of my landing pages here, I'll actually create urls.py. This is how I typically design app URLs as I copy the main configuration URLs, put them inside of my app pages, paste them in here. I get rid of the defaults that are in there other than path. So realistically, that's all you actually need in here other than from.models import, or rather from dot import views. And then the very first view is going to be our list. Wait, actually it's much longer than just list view. It's landing page entry list view. Quite a mouthful, but it now is a URL pattern that I can use. And so we can bring in that URL pattern very similar to admin.site.urls by adding in the import of include. And then down here, we can just say path and say entries slash and include the landing pages.urls. Okay, so it might feel like I just flew by this, but we've already seen admin.site.urls in action. That is that there are a bunch of other URLs in here, not just one. This path right here is just going off of a whole nother URLs page that is confined to the app itself. And so the default path is actually going to be based off of entries slash. That's the path that we'll see here. The trailing slash happens because there's a trailing slash right here, not because of what's in the URL path. So we'll build on this with the next one, but right here now we've got a view, we've got it mapped into a URL, that URL is mapped into the main configuration URLs, and then we also have a template that I just closed to show it. So assuming that my server is still running, I can go into entries, hit enter. There's all my entries. So here's them listed out. Here is that query set or, you know, the actual variable being rendered as well. That is pretty cool. If you ask me, it now has all of the same sort of data that we had inside of, you know, the Django admin. And this is actually what you'd want to start working towards with your end users. You would actually create views and URLs and all of that for them to see. Now, at this point, everyone can see this, which is not great, which is something we will fix. But overall, we have the ability to review a lot of this data, which I think is pretty cool. Now, what I just did hopefully wasn't outside the realm of what you can do. Perhaps I went a little bit faster than other things. Um, and maybe the main confusion would be how I actually iterated through all of this, but all of that's going to be available for you. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that object list there. And now we need to actually lock this page down 
um, in a couple different ways related to our users. Now we're gonna go ahead and talk about users and content. So what I wanna do is with this landing page entry model, I'm gonna go ahead and add in a text field for notes. And we're gonna allow it to be blank and null. Okay, so we'll save that and then we'll run Python manage.py, make migrations, and then Python manage.py migrate. So at this point, if we go back into our home page, what we should see is, well, that notes field not being in there. But what I wanna do, what I wanna work towards is if we go into our entries, that if I go to any one of these entries, I can write some notes in here about it. That's really the point here. Now, the key thing that's sort of missing out of all of this, well, is twofold. Number one, this entries page, anybody can access, so that's a problem. And then number two, how do I actually have the user that's logged in being assigned to those notes? Those things we'll figure out right now. So the first thing is actually attaching a user to any given model. You attach them with a foreign key. So what I'm gonna do here is write notes by equals to models dot foreign key. And this is gonna be equal to the user model itself. For now, we're gonna go ahead and set that to auth dot user. I'll explain why in a moment. After we declare what it's set to, we need to declare how it's gonna be handled when it's deleted. So this is really just a field for, hey, if the user that's assigned here is deleted, that entry is deleted, what do we do? And in this case, I wrote set null, which means that I can also, or should also allow the field to be null itself. Now, I also don't need it required, so I'll go ahead and say blank equals to true. In other words, if my user of CFE is deleted, then all of the entries that I've ever written notes on will just remove my name from it or that user's name from it. That's it. Okay, so now that we've got this, let's go ahead and run our migrations again and migrate. And then we'll jump back into the admin. Refresh in here. Now we can go on the landing page entries. We can click on any entry and we see notes by. So this is great, exclamation mark, notes by, add my name or my user, save and continue. Okay, so those notes aren't listed anywhere. We can't actually see them just yet. But before I add the ability to see them, I want to address the user string here. A part of you might be like, wait a minute, we've seen the user model before and that was in our tests. We used this right here to get the user model which is true, that does get the user model, but it's actually a class, it's a, a proper class itself, where this is just a string, it's a string declaration to a class. It's subtle, but it's definitely different. So this right here, I can I have methods, I can initialize a, a actual user, I can run you know, user.objects.create and so on, whereas this, I can't uh, do objects.create on it, that, that doesn't make any sense. So this is the default. And to give further evidence that it's the default, we can run that one command again of dump data, hit enter. And if you scroll up a bit, what you'll end up seeing is auth.user. It's somewhere in there. Or I could obviously do the string of auth.user here like we did, which will give me out all of the user models themselves. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because it's certainly a long-winded way to better future-proof your Django project is to go from django.conf, import settings, and instead of declaring this, you just declare the default value, which is settings.auth user model, just like that. Now, what this does is it prepares us if we ever wanted to customize the default Django user model, this is now prepared to do so. So I don't have to do all sorts of other things related to this model if I did change that user model which I think is a, an interesting and fascinating thing to do. But at this point, if I run my migrations, I did change the data, no changes were detected. And that's because of course, this right here is just set to auth.user and that's it, cool. So with that out of the way, let's actually take a look at the landing page entries and narrow them down inside of a view. So at views.py, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and copy 
this entry list view. And I'll paste it right below. This time I'm gonna go ahead and say entry list notes view. Okay, so we've got our original query set, which I no longer want, I want none, as in this is my new default. I'll go ahead and map this into my URLs here. So I'll grab this path and we'll do that view and just write out notes. Okay, so back in here, we'll go ahead and append notes to the URL. So it's entries slash notes, we'll hit enter, empty. Great. Now it's empty for several reasons, but <laughs> the main one is just this. So when we use a request, otherwise whenever we're on a view, we can actually say user equals to request.user. Now this is an instance of the user class itself. This is going to give me, in my case, I'm logged in. So it's gonna be my CFE user, which is user um, one, right? And so we can actually verify that this user is logged in with if user dot is authenticated, then I can actually narrow down this query set based off of that user. And I can do filter and user equals to user, or well, actually not user, but rather notes by equals to that requested user. Okay, so now if I save it and come back into my notes, what do you know, my narrowed results? That's of course because I added it right in here. And of course, if I come back in and do another one with some gibberish, hit save and continue, go back into my entries, there we go. Now I've got that gibberish there and well, what do you know, it's actually working. So this is a really cool thing. So now I can actually change the data that's coming through. Now granted, we have been assigning the user in the model. What we still need to do is assign the user in the view, as in up here somewhere up here, which we will definitely get to. But the other thing about the actual narrowing down of user content, your intuition might not be to use the is authentication method here or property. Instead, you might actually do something like this where you're trying to filter by the user. This is sensible. You come back and you look at it. Hey, it's still working. But then when you go and log out and try and do it again, then you get this error. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this error from beginners. It's been a lot. It's because they are trying to use an unauthenticated user as a user. It's just not the same thing. So that's why this is here. So we can comment this one out. Refresh in here, empty. There's nothing showing up, which is cool. Now, of course, that's not always what we're gonna wanna do. We might have several other things that we wanna do that are related to this user model. So back up into our list view here, let's grab that user again. And again, we'll go ahead and ask whether or not they're authenticated. And really I want the inverse of that. So if they're not authenticated, then I will re return some sort of response. And then if they are authenticated, I also wanna check on whether or not they are staff. Otherwise, we're gonna return another response. Now the thing about this notes here is I totally could add the is staff method as well but I don't necessarily need to, right? Because, well, users probably won't be, they probably won't have the ability to filter any notes by themselves if they're not staff, which kind of means that we still have some more stuff to do related to the form, which I haven't done yet. But nevertheless, we have this ability to now change the response altogether. And so in our case, I'll just go ahead and change the response based off of HTTP response and say you must log in first and give a status of, let's say like 400, something like that. And then you must be staff. Okay, so we save that and now we go back into notes or rather not notes, but entries itself. And now we see you must log in first. And then of course, if I comment that one out and check whether or not they're staff and refresh is you must be staff. Okay, great. So something I'm not gonna cover, but worth checking out is a decorator called a login required and another one called staff member required. Both of these are great. Staff member required will actually redirect them to the admin to log in. Login required will redirect them to, well, a login page, which we will not be setting up. 
a custom login page that is. There's a lot of ways to do it, but it's just outside the context of this particular course. So there is one last thing that I wanna mention related to the user object or the request.user object is that they are both available inside of a template. So if we go into our templates like list.html and just do request and then request.user and then user, we can use all three of those things and refresh in one of these. Let's go into login first and go back into entries. And now we see this is the request object itself. Notice the get method is in there. Also is the path. We have the user and the user. So, you know, you could do is staff and so on. So there's a lot of good stuff about the templates itself. Now, typically speaking, I don't put that logic in something like a list view like this. Instead, I would put that logic in my nav bar. So this is actually where I would want to put whether or not a user is authenticated. So let's just do that really quick. First off, the navbar brand, we'll go ahead and make sure that it goes home. And we'll also make sure that the home link goes home. So what I want to do here is this link right here. I'm going to go ahead and copy it and paste it twice. We'll go ahead and do notes and entries. So we use slash entries for the entries and then slash entries notes. So all I want to do is show these things up if the user is staff. That's it. So if request.user, and I'll go ahead and do end if, that is how you do a condition inside of a Django template. You open it and close it. Now request.user, remember back to the view, we did dot is underscore staff. The same thing applies here, is underscore staff. We save that, we refresh in here, now I can actually navigate around. So not only am I seeing different things, but I can also navigate to different pages because of that. And of course, maybe all of these other links I don't need anymore. So let's go ahead and break this one down and maybe this one. So we save it and make sure we save the nav bar, refresh in here, and now I can go to these different pages. Um, so pretty cool. Now the other aspect of this, of course, is to start to look at individual items so we can actually write notes on them. Uh, so we can actually finish off the last few concepts, which would be actually programmatically applying the notes by within a form itself, which I think is also very fascinating in of itself too. Um, but at this point, we now have a pretty robust way to require a user to be logged in to see different kinds of pages. We also require a user to have a kind of permission that we designate to also see certain pages. So now we just need to be able to assign this user um, in a form of some kind. So let's do that now. Now we're going to go ahead and do a landing page entry detail view. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this one right here and we'll paste right below. Instead of being list view, we'll call it our detail view. And down here, we'll go ahead and say detail as well. Okay, so go ahead and copy this and bring it into my URLs. And what we want is, I'll just leave an empty string for a moment. So views dot detail view. And so what we want is a dynamic path here. This path will change with some sort of argument in here. So before I actually do that, let's go ahead and see what I'm talking about by going into the admin. You can learn a lot about designing these systems by going into the admin. I'll probably repeat that a lot of times. We go into landing pages here. Here's our list view. What do you know? It looks a lot like our list view right here. If I click on one of these items, now I go to the change view, the update view, the detail view. So it's a detail view in the sense that it has to get all of the data about this item. And if we look in our URL, we see that there's a number seven here. Now this seven is corresponding to the auto-generated ID. If we go to one, what do you know? One's in here, unless you deleted it. If we go to a hundred, what do you, well, actually, what happened there? Let's go to a hundred. And what do you know? It says landing page with entry ID a hundred does not exist. Perhaps it was deleted. You might've seen that already if you deleted one. 
But the point here is they all have auto incrementing IDs. Now we could verify these IDs by going into our admin, adding this read only field and adding in ID, right? So now if I refresh in here, what do you know? I see the actual ID. So going back into my entries list here, what I wanna do is when I click on one of these, I want it to go to an ID of some kind, like one, two, three, or so on, right? And so this is where we need to update how our URLs are routing. This is a dynamic URL. So inside of Django paths, what we could do is use these curly brackets here, or rather the greater than and less than side brackets, the angled brackets, we're gonna go ahead and declare the data type that we're using. In this case, it's an integer. And then what field we wanna map it to, what argument we wanna map it to. In this case, it's ID. So making sure our server's still running, we've got it going in here. Now what I can do, of course, is refresh in here. And I should have an integer of ID. I missed a trailing slash. That's why it's still saying not found. Let's add that trailing slash back in. And we refresh in here. This time we get a, a page does not exist because, well, I didn't create this template yet. So let's go ahead and create that template inside of my landing pages, detail.html. I'll go ahead and copy list and paste it in here. This time, of course, it's gonna be simply just entry. And I'll go ahead and do object.id. And we'll just say entry number object ID. And then I'll go ahead and just add in a few items here. So P being, you know, email, something like this. And then we'll just repeat that a couple times with name and name and then timestamp. And then maybe how long ago? We can say time since created and timestamp pipe time since. A pretty cool little template filter. There's a lot of them. Feel free to check them out, but we can go ahead and do this. All right, so there is our new data. I'll go ahead and update our title just like that. Refresh in here and wait a minute, I have no data. So of course I don't have data. If you've been paying close attention, you'll know why. This object here, this context object, well, it's nowhere to be found in my context dictionary. So we actually need to find it. Now, what I can do here is first off, just say object, and this is qs.first. qs.first or qs.last will actually give me an object from this query set. So if I refresh in here, it says one, and what do you know, it's showing up. If I do 100,000, exact same thing. Of course, this is not what we want. We want to get the actual item itself. Now, there's a shortcut to do this, and I'll go ahead and add it in. It's called git object or 404. So if I scroll down a bit, now what I can do is back into the detail here. I can actually say my obj equals to git object or 404 of this particular entry and then pass in the argument that I want to look up. In this case, I'm just putting ID back in it being one, which might be the exact same object in this case as well. So we save that and refresh in here. What do you know? The exact same object at ID of one. So again, I want this to be a parameter that can change. The way it changes, of course, is based off of the URL. The URL itself is sending in an argument to the view. What do I mean by arguments? Well, request is an argument, args, and keyword args. So I can actually print those things out. So let's print out args and keyword args and see what we've got. So we save that and I'll go ahead and go into the shell here or the console so it's running and we'll refresh in here. Now I can see that my keyword arguments have one called ID. So what I could actually do is I could pass in the ID right there, get rid of all this, scroll down a bit and call this ID. Now it's dynamic. Now, if I go into entry one, it still shows me one, but if I go to entry five, it actually changes. And if I go to 500, it gives me a 404 page. No landing entry matches the given query. So the reason that this is so important is because we need to have the ability 
to look up individual items. But of course, this might not be the only way you end up looking up a single item. Maybe you don't use it by ID. So another way to do this, the longer form way, if you will, would be to put it into a try block and say object equals to landing page entry dot objects dot get ID equals to ID. And then we'll go ahead and say accept pass for a moment. And I'll go ahead and also say up here, object is none. Okay, so what I wanna see here is the exception that's happening. So go ahead and do exception as E, or rather, I will just trigger the exception. So I'll go ahead and copy this right there. Okay, so if you didn't put it in a try block and you just put it like this, let's see what that exception looks like. If I refresh now, it's not giving me a 404 error, it's giving me an exception called does not exist. This is a 500 error. This is actually a server error. So to solve that specific error, we would put it in this exception and then we would say landing page entry dot does not exist. And here I would wanna raise HTTP 404. And to get that HTTP 404, we import it from Django.http. And I'll go ahead and now get rid of this exception here, save it. And refresh. Now it gives me a page not found. Okay. So there's a lot of other things that I could do to improve this and improve the lookup itself. But I wanted to show you how to do an individual lookup because these arguments here are actually identical to these arguments. But if I used, let's say for instance, if I used an object that had multiple ones, so I'm going to show you what I mean by this. We'll go ahead and say user equals to, or rather notes by equals to user. Okay, save that. Let's go in the admin. I believe we have two that have notes by our user. So let's refresh in here. Now I'm getting this get returned more than one landing page entry, it returned two. And that of course is because I didn't filter it. Instead, I tried to get one item. So you're gonna get tripped up on here every once in a while if you're doing this incorrectly. So this type of filtering, this type of querying, definitely gets a lot more complicated, especially when you start adding in foreign keys, which is why I just wanted to mention this because it's definitely something you'll want to learn more about. And so the quick and easy way to solve this, if you would call this easy, is to then say, handle that exception as landing page entry dot multiple items or multiple objects returned. This time we'll go ahead and do, it is still that user. Then we just filter down and say first. And now we should have that object. So if I refresh in here, let me get rid of this exception here. Refresh in here now, it actually does grab some sort of object. It's not the correct one, but it is some sort of object. So. This right here is definitely more advanced, but it is often solved by this right here. Now, typically speaking, when you're trying to get an individual object itself, using the ID is absolutely the way to go. It's not usually the user themselves, but I think that's where it can get confusing is remembering that filter itself will filter down a list, thus always returning a list, whereas get will not filter down a list, but rather to return an object or none or raise an error, right? And so that's what we saw. We saw this raising an error by using that note, notes by. And so the reason I actually left this for such a bigger video is because of that. You're gonna get tripped up on this every once in a while. You might not believe me now, but yeah, it's gonna happen. I've done it so many, many times. So hopefully you'll think back to this and come back to exactly how do you do an individual lookup, a single item query, a get object, versus how do you filter a query set? How do you narrow down results? So hopefully all that makes sense to you. If it does, great. Now that we can grab this individual object, we can start to update it much like we do in the ad. All right, so now we need a form to actually add our notes to any given entry. So to do this, I'm gonna start with removing some redundancy. And so in my landing pages, I'm gonna go ahead and add in mixins 
.py. And in here, I'll go ahead and say class bootstrap form mixin. And it's just an object. And what it's going to do is literally this init method here. So if I copy this whole init method, I'll cut it out actually. And I'm going to bring it into this mixin here and save it. That's it. I don't really need anything else here. So the next thing is I'm going to go ahead and bring it into my forms. So from dot import mixins, and I'll just use mixins dot that bootstrap form mixin. And I'll go ahead and use that same thing on this form and thus getting rid of the need to write all of these things, right? I mean, perhaps I need to keep email two in there and the placeholder for it, uh, depending on the actual form itself. But I'm going to go ahead and just leave it like that. Now, this right here is just Pythonic. It's not really Django specific other than the fields itself. So if you need to, you can just put in fields as an empty list here to better understand what's going on with this. And so uh, let's come back in here and I just want to verify that that is still working and sure enough it is. Okay, so the reason for that, of course, is to clean things up and not repeat ourselves too much and get closer to like what you would end up doing with a number of forms and repeated data. So the first thing is we'll go ahead and say class, I'll call this entry notes model form. And it's gonna take in the same arguments here. My new mix in that I just created for bootstrap. Then I'll go ahead and do class meta and we'll go ahead and give some fields here. Let's just add in the fields like name, email, and notes. Okay, so I'll leave those fields in. And now we wanna use this form. So we'll go into our views here and I'm gonna use it in this detail view. So let's make sure we import it in. So scrolling down, we get rid of all of these comments form being that entry form, we'll do request.post or none. And then we'll say if form dot is valid, I'll just go ahead and say pass for now, but I will print out form dot cleaned data. So you might have some intuition as about to what's happening with this, but before we go much further, let's go ahead and bring that form in and then into our template. We're gonna go back into our home page here. We can just copy this form and bring it into our detail. And oops, I should get rid of that UL block there. And underneath that data, I'll go ahead and put this form in. And so now let's go into our entries. I don't have them linked yet, so let's go ahead and actually link them too. So in a list view, you may recall just a href being entries slash object ID. This is not the best place for this. I will actually change some details related to that link in a moment. So let's go ahead and link it up. There it is. So this should actually bring me some links and I can click on it. And now I'm getting um, all this in here. Great. So my model form has no model specified. Looks like I maybe skipped a step. Ah, yes, I just put fields. Let's go ahead and add in our model landing page entry. Great. I love these errors because they are very, very explicit. Now, okay, so there's a problem here, right? This data is not showing this data. So this is actually a simple fix. And that simple fix is by going into our view, into our form here and passing instance equals to object. That is this object right here, assuming there is one. So we save that. And now if I refresh in here, what do you know? again and again. Fantastic. So if I just said Justin Mitchell and hit send or save and then refresh in here, it's asking if I want to keep doing it, right? So it is saving the data though, or is it? If I actually refresh in this data, it's not saving it. Now, of course, that's because I don't actually call save on it. So what I need to do then is I need to get rid of this, of course. And if you remember back, I can do obj equals to form.save commit equals to false. This right here is going to override the context object that comes in. 
So now what I could do is obj.notes by, and well, my user has to be authenticated to get to this point. They have to be staffed out to, to get to this point. So now I can use notes by user and then obj.save. Now the question is, do I need to reinitialize the form? I shouldn't have to. Realistically, I will because I don't wanna to have to redo the form data. In other words, the request post data, I don't want it to automatically resubmit it. We'll look at both ways. First off, I'll do, I don't have to, and we'll take a look. So we come back in here. This time I'll go ahead and change my name again. And I hit send. And if I go ahead and refresh the page with command R or control R, it's gonna confirm this resubmission. Hit continue. And sure enough, my name's there. Let's actually go to the URL again, hit enter. This time it's actually showing up, especially if I refresh it. So all I need to do is reinitialize the form itself with the actual instance that it is to allow for it to clear out, if you will. So I don't actually resubmit the form every time. So again, Justin Mitchell, I hit send. What do you know? There it is. If I hit refresh, it's looking to try and refresh that form again. Weird. Well, this is actually because of how these form data ends up working. Um, what I'd actually want to do here is return a HTTP response redirect. And yet again, what I could do is use an F string and entries slash obj.id, just like the links we just added. Now this HTTP response redirect needs to be imported or imported up here. So now if we save it and hit save, it actually just redirects the page. It's kind of hard to tell, but it does. So the other thing about this is if I add some notes here, exclamation mark. So this is entry number four. I should be able to go into the admin now, go to entry number four by just adding it here. I should see that it says some notes. And if I change them, changed notes, exclamation mark. We hit send, go to the admin, change notes. Great. And of course the user is nest is uh, in there for notes. That's fantastic. Okay. So I hard coded two places for where this actual update form or this detail view ends up being. So this is actually a really good place to now introduce another item that is very common and well, pretty much a standard thing to do on Django models, and that is create a method called get absolute URL. And we can do it with simply an F string of slash entries slash self.id with that training slash. So this can be improved more by shortcutting it. And there's a lot of things with our URLs that we can shortcut here. But even if I just hard code it in, I can now use this everywhere I need to. So in my views, the HTTP response redirect will be just simply object .get absolute URL. And then in my list, again, instead of writing all this out, it's object absolute URL. And so we can save that and we can refresh everywhere we need to. The links should still work, better notes should still work and so on. Pretty neat, right? Now, one of the other things that you might be interested in doing is like saving the last time notes were added, right? Um, now we could do this with updated or, well, let's say for instance, we didn't have a user and then we wanted to add notes first added, being models.date time field, auto now being false, auto now add being false, null equals to true and blank equals to true. So there's a lot of ways on how we could go about doing this. The way I'm gonna do it is in the view. So in here, I'll just go ahead and say if not obj.notes by, then obj.notes first added, and this is gonna be timezone.now, which of course we need to grab, and that's from Django.utils import 
the import the time zone package. Then we'll go ahead and run python manage.py, make migrations, and then python manage.py migrate. And now what we'll do is in our admin, we'll see notes first added, right? So let's go ahead and add a new entry here. Go back home and say abc, abc uh, at again, again, dot com. And there we go. Entries, here it is. What's up? Send, okay. Go back into our entries here, again, again. And what do you know? Now I have that timestamp. So there's a lot, a lot that we could still do with all of this data, but we now have a fairly robust way to ingest data from our users. We have a way to add notes about them, right? I can literally say, oh, just talked to this person. They are awesome. Gonna sign up when we launch. And this could be anyone on your staff doing this. They can't, they, they can't delete this, but they just created the note itself, right? Which is great. That's exactly what we want again and again. And so we also have the foundation here for so many social media sites. The foundation being the entries, if you change entries to quote unquote posts, these are all of the posts or tweets or blog articles that I wrote, right? You could think of it that way. We've got a bunch of time here. We've got an author potentially. We've got an email. We've got a time since created. We have a timestamp as to when it was actually first added or last added or whatever. Like there's a lot of options here now that you could build on top of, which is why I did all this. Now, of course, there's still a challenge ahead of us, which is how do we create users and how do we log them in? There's a lot of third party packages to do that. My favorite one is Django Alloth. This should have its own course because there's a lot to it that are beyond just email and password, but also including social authentication and all that sort of stuff. But overall, right now, we've got a lot of very robust features. Now the search field was never implemented, how to search in Django. This is something that also is pretty cool. Um, it, it does go back to how our list page work. This is a simple search engine here, but it's outside the context of what it is that we're trying to accomplish with this, which is really building momentum for our project. So at this point, we need to improve the UI, just finish off the UI so this thing is ready to go into production and actually start collecting emails. Now, part of the UI is gonna be the send button and stuff like that um, in the places that we want, but also so that it's not just a big form here, but we actually have some real other data so we'll learn a little bit more about Bootstrap before finishing up. Now we're gonna go ahead and update our user experience and user interface. Now, both of these sometimes go hand in hand, but in this case, what I wanna do is I want to send some sort of message after they fill out a form, right? As of now, I don't do that. Now, there's many different ways on how we can accomplish this. The way I'm gonna do it is by using a built-in feature to Django called Messages. Now these are little notification type messages, system type notifications, not really like your push notifications or an email or something like that. You'll see what this is really quickly. So the thing that we wanna do is import this into our homepage. So we're gonna go ahead and just give an example first. So it's from django.contrib. We're gonna import messages, okay? So in here, the very top of this homepage, we'll do messages.success as in this is a successful message and request, we have to pass in the request itself and then we're gonna go ahead and give the message such, such as like, thanks for joining or something like that, right? So we save that and we come back to our homepage and I'm gonna run this several times, okay? And then if I go into the Django admin and do a quick refresh, I see all of these thanks for joining. Now these are the messages I'm referring to if I refresh the Django admin one time, they're gone. And if I keep doing it, gone completely. So these messages are very short lived. They show up on the request. The next request that actually displays messages will show them. And so 
we need to actually display those messages. Of course, the next part of that is actually pretty simple as well. So before I display the message, I'm gonna go ahead and grab this right here and put it right down with our form right there. So after the form is done, realistically, all these notes I probably don't need any longer. So I'll put that there. And I'll also go ahead and instead of having the form be reinitialized, if it's a successful, I'll go ahead and just do return HTTP response, redirect and slash. Okay, so again, this is all about usability and just improving the experience all around. And I'll get rid of some of these comments in here just to clean it up a bit. And we will eventually get rid of this message.success up here. Now there are other kinds of messages that we can use. I typically use messages when it's either successful or it's an error. So to take a look at the different messages that you might want, just do a Google search for Django messages. You'll find the messages framework. Do a quick search for messages.success and you'll see all of the different options that you might have. Seriously, I use messages.success probably the most, right? So every once in a while I'll do error or warning, but using success is, you know, it's just mostly when I actually have messages. Error messages I make a little bit more verbose, like the form error messages actually show up inside of the form. So I don't have to write out, hey, there was an error. Um, but you totally could, that's another option. Anyway, so now we want to display these messages, right? So to do this, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new template that we're gonna include. I'll call it messages.html on, or in this base directory here. So what we wanna do is we wanna check if there are messages. And then if there are, we're gonna go ahead and render them out. And this is messages context. So again, going back into the settings, if we scroll down to our templates here, we should see our request context in here. And we should also see our messages context, right? So both things have to be there in order for this to work inside of a template. So I can automatically do if messages. Now do be aware if you have your context object being messages here, it will override this or cause wonky things happening. Just so you know, this hopefully isn't that surprising, but it certainly does happen. So now what we're gonna do is create a div and then we'll go ahead and iterate through our messages here. So for message in messages, let's go ahead and add a, another div in here and then we'll do our in for. Okay, so this div right here, I'll just go ahead and give it a class of container-fluid, much like we've seen multiple times. And then in here, I'll just go ahead and render out the message itself. Okay, so what I want in the message itself, I wanna have it displayed. So in, the or, in order for it to be able to be displayed, I need to make sure that I'm including this template tag everywhere I want it to be displayed. Now in my case, I want to put it into base so it's literally displayed everywhere it possibly could be. So base.messages. Now, one of the things that's important to note too is if you did have certain paths, so let's say for instance, if checkout was in the request.path, um, well, you could omit it. You could do something like that. There are other ways to have if statements in here. This is not necessarily something I'm going to keep, but it is nice to know that you can absolutely change where these messages might show up. But again, they're only really gonna show up if it's a short-lived message. So more than likely, you're gonna have it show up everywhere because of the nature of this message. So the other cool thing about this is if I were to change the redirect somewhere, this message would show up on that redirect, not on the current page that it's on. We'll see how that's done too. So anyways, we now want to actually render out this message. We've got it in base. We've finished the template itself. So let's go back to our homepage, refresh in here. And what do you know? There is our message. Okay. So of course, right now it doesn't look that great. It doesn't really look like a message or some sort of notification itself, right? So what we can do is if we go into Bootstrap, we can actually adjust this by using alerts. So inside of components, alerts, or of course, if you just search alerts 
it should give you something related to alerts in here, maybe. Um, and there we go. So it goes alerts, examples, and here's all of the example alerts that we can use. So if we just wanted to grab one of them and paste it in here, and then of course change this to being message, this is literally how I learned Bootstrap. I would just start to see reoccurring classes all across the board after copying and pasting things. Now there are some fundamentals to Bootstrap that I'll talk about soon that aren't related to this specifically, but overall that's a really good way on how you can learn Bootstrap components. Now another thing about this is now my alert will show up. If I refresh in here, what do you know? It looks a lot better, like way, way better, right? Um, and so there is another aspect of this though, and that is this alert primary. So in Bootstrap, we've got a lot of different colors that we can end up using. Now these colors, the way that they are designated is similar across Bootstrap components. But in the case of these components right here, we've got alert primary, secondary, and so on, right? So we can change the way these colors are rendered based off of, well, our warning or our actual success or message, whatever's in here, right? So if we did messages.error and save that, and then refresh in here, well, it didn't actually change anything. So what I wanna do is inspect this element here, and I wanna be able to adjust this class based off of something, as in based off of, well, maybe the error itself. So what I can do then is inside of the classes, I can add it as a tag. So I can do if messages.tags, I can actually put in all of the message tags right in there, if there are any. And basically they all have them, error tag, success tag, and so on. So anyways, we come in here, we've got messages.tags and we refresh. Let me refresh here, save everything, or not messages.tag, but rather message.tag. Make sure it's individual because we're looping through all of the messages. Save that and refresh in here. And now we see alert dash primary and error, right? And so this of course is a CSS class that I could create. I could absolutely make an error class for the alert div or something like that. Or I could use something called extra tags and add in my CSS class here. So if I did alert danger, for example, and this is gonna be, oops, something happened. Right. So now we've got these extra tags in here. If I refresh now, what do you know? It now changes to red. But of course we've got a problem still is I've got alert primary and alert danger on here. Both of course are CSS classes that I don't need. I don't need both of them, I just need one of them. So I can go ahead and cut out this alert primary. And if there are not message tags, right? I can then say else that alert primary. Great. And so I refresh in here now, and of course that's showing up, which is fine. And then I'm gonna go ahead and test this thing out with some email. I don't think we can use Gmail still. And there we go, hit send. And now this one says, thanks for joining. Notice that the reason it says thanks for joining is because we didn't actually add an extra tag for it. And so there are tags in there, there's just not the extra tag. So if you do it the method I just did, you wanna make sure that every time you call one of these, you add in extra tags being, you know, whatever you wanna call it, which is alert success in this case. Now, another thing about that is you can have even more if statements inside of if messages.tags, right? So like, let's go ahead and break this down a little bit. And I can say that if, you know, success in message.tags, then I can go ahead and make sure that it says alert success or something like that, or alert primary, either one. So now if I save it and rerun the form with some gibberish and hit send, now I get this thanks for joining. Well, I did actually add it twice, but notice that it is in there two times. So that's another thing that you might consider doing. Now I don't want all of these spaces in here. We don't need extra space in our actual uh, HTML classes at all. 
And I'm certainly not gonna do what I just did. Another thing that you could end up doing is adding in um, additional tags in general and making new sort of message functions that you might wanna end up using. Uh, so you make it a little bit more convenient for yourself, like defining a function in here, call it like um, did succeed or something like that, that would end up taking in the request and then automatically calling those things. Uh, but that's, that's not something we need to do. I'll go ahead and get rid of this one now. And there we go. So now we have this message success. And that one's thanks for joining. And then maybe in our, you know, our detail view where we updated everything, we can say, you know, uh, message updated. Or we could even go even further and use an F string and say obj.id updated. And that's another one that's pretty cool because now we can actually get the specific note or entry updated. So entry object ID updated, right? So that object of course is coming from there, which is also pretty nice if we need to do that. So that's Django messages along with bootstrap alerts. Now, one of the things that you also might wanna do with bootstrap alerts is to allow for you to dismiss it. So if you go into dismissing, we could do this close button where I can actually close it right there. And so what we could try and do here is I'll go ahead and copy the close button itself. We could, we could copy this whole class, but we probably don't need the whole class. So we go back into our messages inside of the alert itself, as in underneath the message. Notice that the message does not have any things around it other than strong there. I also can go ahead and grab these right here. Those two classes are necessary. So I go ahead and bring those in, save it. And then we come back in here, refresh. Now I'm gonna go ahead and give a, another email here and send, send it. And now I can actually dismiss this message, which is also great. So yeah, we can use this in a lot of different places, the alerts as well as the messages. And I think it's pretty straightforward on how it's done. Now to me, this adds a lot to the usability of your application, like a lot, a lot because now it's actually giving you some more robust responses than just a new form. That doesn't always make a whole lot of sense. So when it doesn't make sense to just have a new form, something else that you might consider doing is, let's go back to that homepage again, is actually reinitializing the form and then saying, did submit being false. And then what do you know, did submit being true. And so you could call it was successful and stuff like that too. I'm just going to call it did submit. And then back into my template, then I could come in and say, if not did submit, there's my form. Otherwise we could add a P tag and say, thank you for your entry. And then, and if, save it and again this time something like that look it's not gmail it's gannel now it says thank you for joining and thank you for your entry right so it actually does sort of do the duplicate of that um, and this also means that if i refresh it i still can resubmit this form right so perhaps that's not necessarily what i want to do perhaps i want to redirect it uh, which is also something that's pretty nice. So if I do the redirect, the last thing that I'll mention is that we could think about this did submit part as a request session item. So I can also do request.session of did submit and say true. Okay, so there we go. And now inside of that same template, if not, request.session did submit, then it's gonna show us up. So I will, okay, so I, I just resubmitted the form. So let me log out to end my session. Ending my session allows me to come back into the home page, and then I'll go ahead and do it again and hit send. Now it's there. And if I refresh over and over and over again, it's not gonna show that form. Cool. So again, another improvement of usability.
And so the big part of the reason that we have these session variables, it's actually very similar to like what we were doing with our messages is they were being associated to our request in some form. This is also being associated to our request in the sense that if the session ends, then this, this variable goes away. So as soon as it ends, it goes away. You could also delete it with simply delete and the session itself or the item itself that will delete it as well. Um, so you can also attach these things onto your session. Um, and all of these are, I think, valid methods of something you might do in a landing page environment. So you're improving the user interface, you're giving some messages and you're adding in some alerts. Now the session object itself, there's a lot of things that we could talk about that are related to that. A lot of times the session will end when the user logs out, there is a way to configure Django so the session can end when the browser closes, as in when you close this browser, which is also pretty neat. It's not the same thing as cookies, it's actually gonna be on the back end. so the way you're having that session work is not the same as using cookies. But of course, that is for another time. Of course, you could also learn about sessions on the DjangoProject.com. I think that there's parts of them that are really straightforward, much like this message is, and then there's parts of them that get um, maybe a little bit more challenging to use. So when in doubt, I would say maybe use sessions sparingly, like very, very sparingly as to what you put in here. And ideally don't put sensitive data in here either. Anyways, so that's it for this one. Let's go ahead and take a look at a little bit more related to Bootstrap so we can just better design our application altogether. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and talk about bootstrap layouts. That's more specifically, we're gonna talk about the rows and columns so that we can move our data around so it's presented in a way that's hopefully very user-friendly, but also a lot closer to what we actually want. So what I did here was I created a template, just a blank template mostly, as you see. I created a view that renders just that template, and then also I added it into a URL path so that I can load it up much like this. So go ahead and do that now, or just follow along and you can try this stuff out. To me, so much about Bootstrap itself is just trying things out. And I like doing it on an individual page so I can get a better sense as to what is going on. So the first thing that we wanna do when it comes to using Bootstrap layouts is we create a div class or a div element here with a class of container or container fluid. So let's take a look at what that does in just a moment. After we create that container, we're gonna go ahead and create another div and then another div. Okay, so this div right here is gonna be our row. And inside of the row, guess what it has? It has columns. So this is not meant to be rows and columns of a spreadsheet table at all. So don't think of it that way. Think of it more in terms of rows and columns in like terms of a, you know, if you were building a cubby or um, some sort of like shelving unit, think of it in that way, not in terms of spreadsheets. So anyways, we've got a row and column here. And so what I could do is I can add in this placeholder class here, and I can also add in a background of primary. So with that in mind, I'm also gonna do that same thing, but this time, instead of doing primary, I'll go ahead and do success. And so we wanna see what this looks like, right? What's the result here? And you might guess we have two columns and one single row and then a container. So if we go back into our page here, Basically what's happening is it's cutting the row in half. That's it, just cutting the row in half and that's something we can use. So this text right here, or this class is a placeholder class that allows me to really illustrate what's going on here. Now, of course I could probably put in some text here as in hello world and you know, maybe just column like that. And so we see hello world and column. Okay, cool. So if I get rid of that placeholder, it just is gonna give me those background colors. Let's save everything and then toggle back and there we go. Okay, so now what we've got here is two columns that are cutting a row in half. So you might be wondering how many columns can I put? Let's go ahead and copy this same thing and paste below here. On this container fluid, I'm gonna go ahead and now use just simply container and then I'll do a MB-5. This stands for margin bottom and five 
elements here. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but now if I add in, let's say for instance, I add in a few more columns. I'm actually gonna copy this so it oscillates between colors. So quite a few more columns. And when I refresh it, it changes quite a bit. So what we see is this gap here. This gap is actually removing it from the original container fluid or rather container that I have. And then it has a bunch of columns in here. So what it is showing us here is that if we have too many columns, it's going to wrap them to the next row, essentially. It doesn't make a new div class for that row, but that's what's going on here. And I'll highlight that as we go forward. And now going back in here, if I change this to container fluid, save it, and then refresh on this page, we see now that these are lined up. So container will bring it in a little bit. Container fluid makes it all the way across the page. So that's kind of interesting too. So now I'm gonna go ahead and copy the original one uh, all over again. And we wanna take a look at how many columns I can actually put here. Okay, so I of course know what the number is um, and it is going to be a function of something fairly interesting. So first I'll do column dash one on all of these. So we can see one column width. Save that and refresh in here. One, two, three, four, five, six. And if I do, let's add a margin bottom here to separate it out. Refresh in here. And now I've got six across. So that of course, hopefully tells you that you double that and we've got 12 across. So in other words, we've got 12 possible columns or really 12 ways to divvy up any given row. And the important part is that it's about the row. It's not as important about the container. So let's go ahead and do this all over again. This time I'm gonna go ahead and add in just like that. Let's make sure we've got everything closed off. Looks like we did. Okay, so when I say that it needs to add up to 12, what that means is these two numbers have to add up to 12. So if we did four, this would have to be eight. I refresh in there, four, eight. And this is even easier if we do four and eight. So the other part that's really cool about this is if I break it down, it's still four and eight, at least up at the very top, right? So what happens is we can actually introduce another thing called a breakpoint. But before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and add another four here and refresh it and notice that it's going to the next row. If I added a margin bottom of five on this one in particular and refreshed, I now get this gap here and this here. So as you might imagine, this can start to get a little weird from time to time. So to solve this particular issue, you would just add another row or you could do something else called gutters, which is something I'm not gonna talk about right now. But just a general rule of thumb here, when we are creating these elements, we basically need to think of them in rows or columns so that it's either 12 columns or a single row. So now let's go ahead and bring it up again and do one more thing. And this time I'm gonna say column auto. I'll go ahead and get rid of this. We'll leave this one at column four and this is gonna be auto. Now I refresh in here and I see auto is only giving me one right here. If I change it back to column, it's giving me the full thing. So auto may or may not change the size of it, uh, but column certainly does. Column is basically going to fill up that entire column no matter what size it is. So if we go back to two, then we've got this column at two. If we go back to eight, then it's eight long. If we go back to 11, then it's gonna be one, right? So we can absolutely change how big each individual column is. Also pretty nice. Okay, so now the next part would be, let's change the color a little bit, warning and info. Now we're gonna do these breakpoints here. So the first breakpoint I'll do is LG. This one I'll get put at 10 
and I want it to add up to 12, so I'll do LG and two. Refresh in here. Okay, so no big deal here, 10 and two. That looks like about 10 and two. But if I go to break it down, slowly, boom. As soon as the browser is not large, it goes down to basically a 12 width column. So in other words, it's basically column 12 up until the browser gets large. And that's how breakpoints work. So once you get to large, it goes, it breaks it, and then there we go. There's another way to do this is if you inspect the element here, um, what you could do is you can actually change the size by going into this icon. Um, and this is how you do it inside of Chrome. Uh, there's probably a way to do it on Safari as well. But the nice thing about this is you can actually select different kinds of devices uh, based off of its size. So you can actually review what your page will look like and the elements will look like on those various items, right? And so I think that's cool to use sometimes, but I actually just use this browser and I, this is how this is exactly how I do it um, when I'm really just trying to get into it and test it out. So the idea behind breakpoints is really nice. So let's say for instance, I'm gonna go ahead and copy this one again and we'll paste it in here. Let's say for instance on mobile, I want it to be one half, right? So when it's as small as it possibly can be, I want it to be one half. So that would mean then at the minimum, I would put it at half. And then maybe at large or a certain level, uh, then I'm gonna go ahead and change that equation a little bit. So let's say for instance at medium, it's gonna be eight, and then this would have to be four. And then when it's really large, when it's really big, then it's gonna be a little bit different. So here we go, we're at the largest state. Now we are gonna be at the medium state. It still fits pretty well. And then once we go to the small state, it turns into being six. Okay, so we can actually see all of that changing, um, which is fantastic. Um, so when we come in to use this in our own projects, a lot of the things that we'll end up doing is very similar to what you just saw. But let's say for instance, I wanted to have uh, an item that's just in the middle of everything, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and say, I want in the middle. So how do we actually do that? Well, your intuition might be, you know, text center. Text center does center the text in the middle, but the actual element is not in the middle. Let's make this a little bit more clear with making um, everything after medium being four. It's a little bit wider. So the text is in the middle, um, but the blue box is not. How do we make the blue box in the middle? Now this is how it happens with margin. So if I do MX, that means margin on the left and margin on the right. I can actually do MX2. What that does is it just moves it a little bit. I could do MX5. That also would move it just a little bit. And it's really moving on both sides. Now we can actually verify this by going into the inspect um, getting the element selected itself. So move up to the element that has MX5, go into computed, and you can actually see that extra margin on it when that orange part comes up, All right? So that of course is not what I want. I actually, actually want MX auto. And so if I do that, it actually goes in the middle. And now we can see that computed margin. It's gonna be however big the browser is, which is great. And so same sort of thing, we probably want to have different breakpoints for this. Those breakpoints are how it's going to look when it's at least that size, right? So on the smallest size, maybe we want to have it at column 11. And then the small side, like maybe a big uh, phone or a small tablet, maybe we want to have that at eight. Then everything else, we want it to be basically half of the width but still sitting in the center. And of course the background color being there. And there we go. So now it's in the center. And when we start breaking it down, it's always roughly gonna remain in the center, um, but also keep some sort of proportion with the content that's in here, which is also really nice. So this margin, this MX auto really helps center things, but it's not just for centering. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. And I want, on the right. 
So I want to go ahead and go all the way to the right. So we save this. And so if I look at it now, of course, it's still in the middle. So what I want to do is I want to add, I want to add a ton of margin on the left of it. So the left of it is actually where the element starts. So the end is over here. The start is over here. So then we use M S auto as in margin start auto. And that will give us a bunch of space right here. So we'll go ahead and refresh and now it's on the right. Now the same thing, it's not a whole lot different. If we want to go on the left, I want on the left. Now it's M E auto as in margin end. I know it says me, but M E auto. Now it's on the left, right? So we can move these things around. Now, the other part about this is if we have different size columns, so let's give this a column two and I'll still use BG info. And then I'll go ahead and add another one. And this will be a column four. And this one's going to be on the right. What do we do here? Well, it's MS auto. So we save that and we refresh. And now there's a big gap in between these two because we have a specific column size, column four and column two. And then we also have this, this, you know, margin uh, like ME auto on the end of it or ME MS auto on the start of it. And so if I accidentally did just column <laughs> that changes the entire equation because then column without a specified breakpoint or a specified size will just go as big as it can, which in this case will just be eight, right? So column and eight, it's kind of like saying auto. So again, we need to specify a specific size if we want to have a gap in here. Now, this is kind of weird. I don't know how often you'll have this weird gap like this, but switching elements back and forth, I think you will. Same with this. Great. And of course, the breakpoints, especially for those, those gap ones, it's very obvious as to what's going on in here as well. Great. So that is margin with the left and right in, in in mind, right? So we've got ME auto, MS auto, and then MX auto. So the other thing is you can be a little bit more specific. So what you'll often see too, this time I'll just go ahead and put some buttons. So let's do a button class of BTN and BTN primary, hi. And if we did this a few times, let's do info and warning, we refresh, we've got these buttons in here and they have a little bit of a gap. Now, if I actually change that gap to let's do MX zero. So this is margin on both sides is going to be zero. We save that we refresh in here. I'm still not getting a margin. So let me inspect here. We've got a margin of zero on here. And what's happening is I think the gap with the div is causing that margin to happen. But let's make it a little bit bigger. And I'll do MX of five, we refresh. And what do you know? So now we've got a margin on both sides of this that give us this a little bit bigger, right? So that's actually pretty cool too. Spacing also might be involved with this spacing. I don't think it is, but let's take a look. Ah, there it is. It was actually the HTML spacing, which is kind of funny. But anyways, so now I can actually use MX1, MX2, MX3, and so forth to actually space these things out. And of course I can use it on top and bottom as well, which would be MT as in margin top. I could do five. MB as we've been seeing is margin five, or I could do one, or I could do three, four, and up to five. So it's from zero, zero as in no margin, up to five. And that's relative to a lot of different things, but here we go. So once I put margin on both in top and bottom of five, it goes on the top and bottom. No surprise there. Now, of course, this is the exact same thing as saying MY five, because MY, Y as in the Y axis, top and bottom, X of course being the X axis, which is left and right. And there we go. So now we've got margin padding, we've got columns, we've got rows. So the next thing of course is gonna be the final thing will be margin and padding. So what we're gonna do here now is I'm gonna go ahead and grab a column. Notice I'm not putting it into a row, but I will give it a size of, let's say for instance, I'm gonna give it a size of MD and six. I'm gonna use MX auto this time. 
And the BG, it's gonna be primary. And I'll do text white. So we save that and refresh. Okay, so I want on the left. Let's go ahead and just say, give me padding. Okay. There we go. So first thing I'm gonna do is P and five. We'll save that. And what do you know? I get padding on the top, the left, the bottom, and the right. In other words, I have P uh, T as five, P B as five, P start as five, P end as five. So this is equivalent to writing all of this. Now I can also just do PX, which of course is just gonna be the start and end. I could do PY, which of course will just be the top and bottom. But padding itself is gonna be internal margin, if you will. So PY3, PX5, this gives me a little bit of padding all around. And we can use these classes, margin and padding, on a lot of elements. So if I did PY5 on the H1 tag, it still gives me even more padding. If I do MY5 on the H1 tag, it gives me seemingly more padding. It's not actually more padding. The only reason it seems like more padding is because of the background color, but the actual element itself has internal padding and external padding, right? So the div, the parent container, looks like it just got more padding, but it did not. And so this actually looks a lot closer to maybe what I was going for, which is putting some text in the center. And there we go, right? And of course, if I made the actual column itself bigger or smaller, I can see what that does. I can add padding of five here, just like that, right? So we've got all sorts of interesting things here. And the other part of this too is what if I actually added another div a parent div and instead of having all of this in here, I just had padding and maybe I also have, uh, let's just do P5 and M5 as in the same thing, margin all around, padding all around. I refresh in here and what do you know, it actually gives me that much more padding, but it's still stuck in this column of four. So it's gonna be narrowed down to that column. Um, so if I brought it out to just being simply column, well, that's gonna give me 12 all the way across. But if I do six and refresh, there we go. So now we've got this element that's quite a bit bigger. Okay, cool. So that's columns, margin, and padding. But I wanna actually apply this to something. So we'll go ahead and apply it in the next one. And we'll apply a few other things that are related to what we just learned. Um, so I do recommend though, when it comes to Bootstrap itself, ideally you understand all the things that I'm doing here, at least to some degree to where you can now play around with it and feel pretty comfortable. But I do recommend that you go in the bootstrap documentation and play around. So grab some components and apply a lot of the classes that I did, right? So here's a card component. You can just copy this card component, bring it on over and, and apply some of those classes. That's, that's really how you're going to learn how to do bootstrap, right? What I did here, I hope gives you some insight as to mostly how the columns work because that's gonna make a big difference into you know, redesigning our landing page. So it works a little bit better on multiple levels as far as um, like an actual landing page would. So let's actually go and create that landing page now. All right, so now I want to create my landing page here to look a lot more like a real landing page. So to do this, I'm gonna jump on Bootstrap. I'm gonna go into examples here, and I'm gonna scroll down to heroes. Now, heroes are incredibly common on landing pages. Like, this is what I want right here. So this is exactly what I do with it. I go ahead and inspect this element here, and then I go to the element that I actually want. So in that last one, what I noticed is I actually had column LG6, we definitely talked about that as well as MX Auto, right? So we actually see these things in action. Now for me, what I want is maybe this whole block here, right? So I'll go ahead and go to edit as HTML. I'll copy that whole block and I'll go ahead and now jump into home.html and I'm gonna go ahead and paste it above everything that I have. Okay, so I do have an image class in here, which is 
cool, but I actually don't need that image. You totally could use that image if you wanted to use it, at least as an example. You could just grab the absolute path to the source of that image, which is on getbootstrap.com. I'll leave that in for a moment. Next, of course, we've got our centered hero here. And we've already had a title tag, so I'm gonna go ahead and bring in that title tag. And we'll go ahead and put that right there. I'll sort of leave some of this other content in here. Now, one of the things you might notice is I actually didn't add a row. I didn't add a you know, container fluid. That's for a couple of reasons. Number one, base.html has that container fluid. Number two, if there is a container fluid, well, we don't necessarily have to add additional styles as we'll see. So if we go back in to our homepage now and refresh, look at that. I mean, to me, it already looks so much better. Granted, you'd probably want to change out your icon here, but um, this is really cool. And so now that we've got that, let's go ahead and just change this primary button a little bit. I'm going to scroll down here and I see these two buttons. Now, what you can do with buttons especially is you can change them to anchor tags or a tags. And so now what I can do is add in a href and I'm going to add it to an actual anchor and I'll just go ahead and do sign up. So basically somewhere on the page, go down to that sign up tag and I'm going to put that just down here. Okay, so we've got a div here and I'll give it an ID here and the ID is going to be sign dash up, right? The same exact thing. We save it and we'll refresh it here. Primary button, it doesn't seem to do a whole lot. Well, I don't have a lot of room to go. So we'll talk about that in a second, but it does, it does go there. So we'll go ahead and say sign up. Now, when it comes to user interfaces and also user experience, well, we also probably only wanna show this if they haven't signed up in the session yet. I still have that there, so I might as well do something with it. And we'll do end if, and then I'll just do a P tag with this class called lead. And we'll go ahead and say, thank you for signing up. Something along those lines. Now, of course, if you didn't do it in the session and you did it as a context variable, by all means, go ahead and bring that in. And of course, all of that is optional. So if we go back into our page here and I actually did sign up, that should 100% change. So this button here, you might be like, well, how do I update my form so my button looks similar? So back into Bootstrap, let's go back into the docs here, navigate down to the components, click on buttons, and here are all the options for your buttons, right? You can make one a link. It's still technically a button and it also matches the size of all the other ones, uh, but, but it gives a link style, right? Um, and so we've got all these other. Now I'm gonna leave that primary one, so I'll use this particular button. We'll go ahead and copy this. We'll navigate down into our form here. Notice I already have it as button type and all that. I can just change this and go ahead and do submit or whatever you wanna call it. Save that and come back into our page. Now it says submit. Now we did learn about how to space these things out a bit, right? So right now it's really tight in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a margin top of three. Just give me a little bit of space between the button and what's above it. Now the Django Crispy Forms, like I mentioned before, will actually give you even better spacing between these elements. That's a customization. I'm not gonna do it this time, but Django Crispy Forms does really help that a lot. So the other thing is I wanna move this way over here and then embed a video down here. So those are two things that I certainly wanna do. So the video I'm gonna go ahead and use is from my GitHub, so cfe.sh slash YouTube. I'll go ahead and just grab this item right here. And that is my intro video to a lot of the things that I do. I'm gonna go ahead and share it, embed, grab that embed code, and then we'll bring it in to a, another div here. I'll just paste that in. Okay, so coming back into our homepage, I refresh. Now I've got that video there, and then right below it, I've got my form. Okay, cool. So by all means, check that YouTube channel out if you'd like, um, but of course it's completely optional. The point of this is really just to have the video um, embedded. So pick any YouTube video, of course. So now that we've got this video here, and we've got this over here, I wanna actually separate these to being in columns. 
Now, hopefully you remember how to do this from the last one. We first off are gonna go ahead and say a row. Okay, so I'm gonna put them in a row. And I just created this div and then I have this div. So we'll go ahead and do class of column. And then over here, class of column, save it and refresh. And what do you know? Got our video, got our sign up. Down here, I'll go ahead and say now sign up now or something along those lines as well. Maybe not a H1. Let's go ahead and bring it down to H2. There we go. That's a little bit better. And so now we've got a video, but of course <laughs> the video is not responsive. That's not what we want. So going back into Bootstrap, there's a thing called ratios at this point. This does change over time. So if we go into scroll down, I might have to search for it, but in helpers, we've got ratio here. And what ratio allows you to do is have these videos. There's even a YouTube video right here. And so you can actually put a ratio around the video. Now this is gonna be not the column, but more specifically around the iframe here. So I'll go ahead and put this in just like that. And so now what I should see with my video is it's responsive, which is awesome. All across the board, awesome. And so of course I need to change this a little bit. Maybe I wanna have this being column and then MD eight. So it's mostly all the way across. And this is going to be column 12 and then column MD4 so that it does actually break down. So now that when I'm on mobile, perhaps I go something a little bit like this, right? Um, so I have the video and then the sign up form. But I can bring this up and down and I've got all sorts of cool stuff, right? And so that sign up is there. You know, maybe we go back down and grab the sign up and, and or actually add the button for maybe watch video. And so another thing about buttons that are really cool is you can add dash outline inside of a button and it'll do something cool. So we'll add that href as watch. And then down here on the column itself, like I did with the sign up, I'll go ahead and do at ID equals to watch. So we save that, refresh in here, click on watch video, it takes me down. Now, of course, if I actually brought this all the way down into mobile and hit watch video. Now it's gonna be a little bit more like what I actually wanna see, which I think is pretty cool. So of course, the other part about this is the branding and all these colors and stuff like that. There is absolutely ways to customize them quite a bit. Um, the only thing I'm gonna do is just change the background to this up here. So to change the nav bar background, the way I'm gonna approach it here is I'm gonna go into base.html and I'm gonna add a style sheet in here. And we're gonna call this BG and I'll call it CFE. And this is gonna be the background color being hashtag 007 CAE, just like that. So this should probably be an external style sheet, but we'll leave that for another time. Now what I wanna do is take this new style and I also, I'm gonna go ahead and add in important here. I'm gonna go ahead and take this new style and go into base, go into nav bar, and I'm gonna change BG light to now my BG CFE. We'll save that and we'll refresh in here. And what do you know? I now have that color there. So it's a little bit closer to matching what I might want. And then from here, the actual text color of these elements needs to change. Now this is darker, right? So this blue is about a bit darker. So maybe I want this to be white. So in that case, what I do is I look into the nav bars and I wanna find the dark mode, if you will. So if I do a quick search for just simply dark and look for a dark mode or color schemes here, I see here's a dark one, here's a blue one. So we're actually a lot closer to this blue one here than anything. Notice the classes on this blue one. I could quite literally copy these classes and bring them in here. Now, of course, I don't need BG primary because I already had that. Instead, I have BG CFE. I had, I had another background is what I mean. Um, and so now I refresh in here and there you go. So now I have a way to create this content, right? It's like a lot closer to what I might want. 
Um, and of course, you know, I could obviously modify it to where maybe I want the video up here, or maybe I should test several different ways of how this is laid out. And of course you would want to do that. And to me, I just go back into the examples. And a lot of times there's really good ideas in these examples of things that you might want to try. Like for example, this one right here with these albums here, right? If I come in here and go inspect and uh, perhaps I want to grab just one of the rows here. Notice, notice the row, right? Um, this one does have something called gutters, but if I actually went ahead and edit this whole HTML, copied that, and back in our home page, we'll go ahead and paste it after this div right here. I actually realized something. I accidentally closed off the block here. This block content needs to be at the very end. That always needs to be at the very end. Okay, so we save that and we go back into our landing page, refresh, and if I scroll down, now I've got all of this stuff here, right? And perhaps we wanna bring those things in. And to bring those things in, we just scroll back up to where the row is. Let's find it right here. Break that down. I can do a div class uh, in changing the container. So div class being a container and around this, save that, refresh, and doesn't seem to change anything. Ah, there it goes. And then I can actually do a margin top of five. Try it again, cool. What if I did another div class of row and inside of that div class of row, I did a div class of column MD8 so notice that I'm nesting all of those rows and stuff like that inside of another column, right? So that's that's literally all the content there. And I refresh in here now, oh, look at that, right? And so I can also do, of course, MX auto here, and it does bring these things in. Now this thumbnail text, you can ignore that. That's not really the important part because you would actually put an image here. Um, but I also am now showing you another element that you might use, which is, rows within rows or rows within columns, you absolutely can do that. You can nest these things um, as much as you want or need. Now these gutters are also really nice. So uh, gutters are very similar to padding and margin, except it's about what's coming around in this area when things are right next to each other, like they are here, where they're really just on one single row. Um, and we also have a way to separate how many columns are in each row, which is also another cool thing that you can learn about in the documentation. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much it. That is our landing page. We've got a lot of good stuff here. We can watch a video, we can sign up, and we can absolutely test this too, uh, just as the final test of, hey, is our landing page actually functioning as we want? We go ahead and submit it. Sure enough, it is. Notice that it is redirecting me back to that sign up element and it's showing us thanks for this entry and so on. Um, so really, really cool. Um, if you have any questions at this point, let me know. Um, I will add in uh, a few next steps of this uh, in the next one. But the general idea here is learning Bootstrap can really just elevate what your application ends up looking like. Now, of course, Bootstrap's not the only one that does this, but right off the bat, we have a lot of data in here. Certainly some of it is confusing, I'm sure, but if you ever need to edit something, you can always go in these elements here. And this is also another way to really learn how this is all broken down. Um, and it's certainly something that you would wanna spend a good amount of time on. So let's go ahead and talk about next steps. Hey, thanks so much for watching and congratulations on completing this series. Now, I really hope that you completed the project as well because you inevitably struggled from different times. It went probably from, hey, this is really easy, I got this, to, wow, this is incredibly hard, what am I doing here? Right back to, hey, this actually is pretty easy, I got this. Now, that is actually a big part of the learning process in general, not just, of course, with Django or software, but it certainly happens a lot more in software. I think it happens more rapidly in software because 
you can see the fruits of your labor really, really quickly. So what I would recommend for your next step is, of course, if you want to dive into the documentation of Django or Bootstrap or many, many other things that I mentioned throughout the course, definitely do that. But I actually encourage you to build on top of this course and then create a list of things that you would like to know, things that you're like, oh, wow, how do I do that again? What is the point of the get absolute URL method? How do I automatically create that path? I didn't talk about that in this series. I might have mentioned it a little bit, but I didn't show you how to do it. But the point is you want to go through and sort of make questions for yourself that you want to answer. Now that it's fresh in your mind, depending on how long it took you to finish this course, it might be fresh in your mind to where you can actually think of all the different questions that you want to have answered while you learn through your Django, you know, journey, if you will. Now, I want to be a part of that journey and I have a lot of different courses and series to help you through some of the challenges you face. But realistically, you are going to have to do the work. You're going to have to build these projects. You're going to have to be the one that asks the questions when you get stuck. So to me, this is really just the beginning. Yes, you did your first project and it's awesome. I congratulate you. But now we need to go even further, maybe even deeper, maybe take another course. But realistically, I really hope that you make another project so that you can actually get all of those questions in top of mind that you need answered. Thanks again for watching. I really hope to see you in another course in the future. And if I don't, if this is the only thing you take and you make something of it, that is awesome. I'm really stoked for you. Thanks again. See you next time.